Hello and welcome to this episode of Talking to Thinkers with me, Johnny Lyons. Today I have the pleasure of talking to John Dunn, Emeritus Professor of Political Theory at the University of Cambridge. Professor Dunn is one of the most distinguished political theorists of the last 50 years. Over the course of our interview, we shall explore the nature, originality and significance of Professor Dunn's understanding of political theory and practice. We should begin at the beginning of his career and then work our way right through up to the present day. John Dunn was born in England in 1940. After attending a number of schools, including Winchester College, he won a scholarship to King's College, Cambridge to read history. He graduated with a star at first and then made his way to the US as a Harkness Fellow at Harvard University. On his return, he eventually was made a fellow of King's College, Cambridge. He rose to the ranks of the university and this culminated in his appointment as professor of political theory in 1987. By then he had established himself as a major political thinker as well as a prolific author. Among his most celebrated works are The Political Theory of John Locke, Western Political Theory and the Face of the Future, Modern Revolutions, and setting the people free, the story of democracy. Hello, John. You're very welcome. Um, John, if we could uh, maybe start our conversation by you giving us a sense of what sort of views you had arrived at by the time you had arrived at Cambridge in 1959. Well, I wouldn't say the views I'd arrived at were very definite and content but they they did have a shape to them i suppose i they were very much affected um by the fact that i spent several periods of my life abroad before um i got to cambridge um <clears throat> these were of varying length but they were all in places which had uh, some real significance for me the first was uh, in the aftermath of the war um, when my father was an army officer and he was uh, stationed in the um, occupying forces the british army of the rhine um, af- after the war for several years so i lived in germany as a small child and i um, saw uh, what uh, the um, Royal Air Force and the American um, Bomber Command had done to um, German cities, and I, I, it was a, it was quite a, a drastic introduction to a world beyond Britain. Um, obviously, Britain itself was rather different in the war, uh, anyway. Um, so uh, there was that uh, part uh, <coughs> in my life before I long before I got to Cambridge. I also spent uh, two summers um, in, in Iran, in Tehran, at a world historically rather crucial moment. My father had a um, pair of d- diplomatic appointments uh, later on in his career. He was rather fed up with being a career soldier, I think, and um, bored, and he, he was not suited to be a military bureaucrat and had got to a rank where he had to be in the war office if he was in Britain mostly um, and he wasn't suited to that but he he was uh, the military attache in the British Embassy in Tehran at the time when the oil fields were nationalized and that meant that one of his responsibilities because it was the responsibility of the embassy under the British um, policy at the time um, was to try to um, secure the overthrow of the current Iranian government that had nationalized the oil fields. Um, and that involved him in close collaboration with the intelligence people in the, in the embassy. Uh, obviously, I didn't understand much about that at the time. I was, um, uh, I think, either 11 and 12 or 12 and 13. I don't remember exactly. Um, and I didn't, but I, I came to learn more about it as the decades went by. 
And I did have quite a vivid sense even then of um, the, the vast gap between the lives of the um, vast majority of the Iranian population and um, the, uh, the life uh, chances of, uh, of uh, British citizens at home at the time. So that was one, an, another sharp contrast. And the third, which was equally accidental, my father um, had served in, um, in, on a secondment to the um, Indian Army for a bit before the war, and he was in. The, he was an artillery officer, and he was in the um, first uh, Indian Army regiment to be allowed to uh, have guns after the mutiny and rising. And uh, at that time, he, <coughs> if you to, were to fire guns with any point to doing so, you had to be able to do elementary trigonometry, which was quite an advanced skill for a British Army officer, and even more so for an Indian Army officer at the time, um, given the level of education in India. Um, so the, his fellow officers were, um, on average, exceptionally clever and um, uh, impressive people, and three of them subsequently co became commander in chief of the Indian Army, which is a very large army. Um, so they were formidable people, um, and um, that meant that he was, uh, and he was in um, Delhi at the time of um, the Suez expedition. And uh, in, I think it meant that he was, in some ways, a very good diplomatic representative um, in that setting, though in other ways, obviously not such a good one. Um, the, the British High Commissioner, Malcolm MacDonald, um, son of Ramsay MacDonald, actually resigned at the time of Suez because he wasn't prepared to represent what the, what the British state had done and tried to do. Um, anyway, I spent a, a bit over a year, in fact, in um, Delhi at that time. And uh, my father was um, extensively um, engaged in um, doing the sort of things that the British Army officers did when he was young. So he, we, we went out and um, we shot at birds and animals. And um, he, used, he actually went to uh, pig sticking, which was advised and broke his neck actually doing so uh, while he was there. Um, so, I got uh, out of um, Delhi um, quite a lot into the countryside and I saw what um, uh, Indian, <coughs> Indian peasants' lives were like uh, at that time. And that was a very deep shock, a much deeper shock really than the Iranian experience because that was more sort of um, politically intricate. I mean, it was further beyond my range, but I, it really did <coughs> change my um, sense of the world um, decisively, really, I think, the time I spent in India. And I, I, I wasn't at school at the time. I didn't have any education for about, for over a year, year and a half um, at that point. But I had um, lots to think about and um, a very drastic, um, set of experiences to process. So when I got to Cambridge, I didn't have um, a set of views about what politically should be done, or I didn't have a sort of domestic political agenda. I had some attitudes, but they weren't very definite. But I was very deeply interested in the question of why um, human life chances across the world were so very drastically different. And, and I, I, so I was thinking about that. And I didn't um, find in many ways, I mean, the um, university teaching available in the history of tripods very helpful for thinking um, about that. But I, um, I, I did have some very good um, teaching. So, um, I, I learned quite a lot from the history of tripods, but not really, I didn't, I can't say it did anything much to modify my political thinking or political 
sensibility, but I had friends and I was, a, it was a very um, drastic time in many ways. I was um, chair of the university campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, because at that time it seemed uh, potentially significant for the rest of the world, whether or not Britain had nuclear weapons. Um, it sort of become more than anything else a matter of um, sort of domestic political attitude, I, I'm afraid, but uh, now perhaps just as well. But um, at the time it did seem as though there was a sort of um, general human existential um, stake really in um, what happened to, to nuclear weapons for the small number of states that had nuclear weapons and very small besides the United States and the Soviet Union um, and I thought it was very I thought that um, nuclear disarmament for the world was very urgent because it was so incredibly dangerous and of course, it's still incredibly dangerous and probably just as dangerous now as it was then. But um, it, 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 um, it, it's in a different shape now, or, you know, a more shapeless sort of shape, I suppose, the danger. Um, yes, anyway, I mean, back then, I, it was kind of, back then it was kind of the Cold War was, was, was in full flow then, really, wasn't it? You, you, you were living through a very eventful time. You mentioned there the Suez crisis, um, the Korean War had kind of just ended. You were the Vietnam War was beginning, Cuban Missile Crisis, which you know for for a few days a lot of people did think this could be the end. Um, yes, at that point, I mean, because of the um, campaign for nuclear disarmament, I, I um, yes, I I proposed in the in the union the. Um, the, the resolution that we should that the United States should um, suspend the blockade of Cuba on the grounds that it, otherwise um, there might be um, thermonuclear war. And I was briefed by the university's um, leading international lawyers for, for that. I mean, I, so that, I, that was probably the most sort of specific political engagement in many ways of my life. But it, and I marched um, on the Aldermaston March for you know for several years. On one occasion for a very memorable um, few hours alongside Alistair McIntyre, um, who was a great intellectual hero of mine at that time. Sort of in a way, still is. Um, yes. I, I agree with you. I, I'm, I have a lot of admiration for Alistair McIntyre. I don't share his religious views, but I think he's one of the great philosophers of the of the last 50 or 60 years um the it sounds to me that you were you had a level of political engagement that was probably not shared by most of the people uh, at cambridge you, you know you had these early experiences in tehran and india um and your your your, your kind of exposure to politics politics was very real it wasn't theoretical um it was that do you think one of the main reasons why you moved from you said, you know, you did history, um, uh, and yet it didn't have a big political engagement. Was that the background to why you kind of became a political theorist and, and, and ceased to remain a kind of a historian? Yes, it was really. I was, I was, I was never a sort of very sincere historian. Well, I liked it when I was a child and adolescent, I suppose, in a sort of theatrical way. Um, I mean, I liked reading history. And I still like reading history, but um, I I didn't want to spend my life uh, thinking about the past. I wanted to spend my life thinking and, um, in some sense, trying to see what to do about the present because of the future. I mean, I, it's just a temporal orientation, um, and I. At that time, you couldn't actually study politics at the university as such, um, because it, it was still the history faculty was very large, and the, it had been founded, um, you know, a century and a half earlier, um, in order to provide an education in uh, understanding politics, and it, it sort of, <laughs> I suppose, it residually 
presuppose that that's what it was doing, but it, um, its attention had wandered from the project to rather a large degree. So it was, um, you know, it was quite scholasticized and, and um, it, it didn't have, I certainly was very critical as a student of um, history of the way in fact in which it presented history as a form of education. I mean, as I said, there were some very impressive historians and I admired some of them very much and learned a lot from some of them, one or two of them. But um, the, the overall um, character of the, of the history faculty as a sort of educational uh, enterprise wasn't very impressive at that time. Um, I don't think it's less impressive now, actually, but it wasn't very impressive at that time. Plus ça change, plus la même chose. <laughs> the um, one of the things that has struck me because you mentioned there two potent, two figures that were potential were very very influential. I imagine one of them was Moses Findlay. Am I right? Yes, yes. Moses Findlay did have a huge impact on me. Um, I and I was thinking there, you know, one of the books that had a big impact on me was Moses Findlay's book, um, Democracy Ancient and Modern. So he was obviously thinking about things that became very important to you. Um, can you give us a sense of what, what, what made Moses Finley different and how he influenced you? Yes, I, I think it's not too difficult. I mean, he, he was, um, it, it turns out now, although he never acknowledged it in his um, own life, but it turns out now that he had been a member of the American Communist Party when he was very young indeed. He did everything very young indeed. Um, he went to university at a bewilderingly young age, younger than anyone else I've heard of in the modern epoch. Um, and um, he was very, very heavily politically engaged, obviously, um, before the war and during the war. Um, and in the um, after the war, he was um, summoned in front of um, uh, it wasn't the um, McCarthy committee; it was the other one. But um, he uh, and he took the Fifth Amendment when he was asked if he was a communist, and um, he was sacked by his university, the university he was teaching at Rutgers. Um, and it was because of that that he he came to Britain. He was brought to Britain. Um, quite sure, but I believe it may have been by Trevor Roper. But anyway, he was brought to Britain um, and brought to Oxford. And then he got a job teaching um, history, ancient history in Cambridge. Um, and he didn't, um, I mean, he taught ancient history, but he taught it um, in a way which was continuous with his interests in the uh, world as it was and then what was bad about it from his point of view and um, he was he was a phenomenally good teacher he taught um, you how to think really carefully about the reasons for the judgments you were making and he taught you how complicated uh, and interesting the sorts of judgments you could make about the past and he, he was um, and historians are, on the whole aren't very, very um, serious about thinking. I mean, they're serious about showing whatever they think it's that they can show. Um, but they're not very serious about thinking about what's going on in the showing. And Moses was extraordinarily lucid and very, very self-conscious about what is involved in um, justifying your beliefs and um, he, he really taught uh, us I mean it wasn't so special it, it, I, it was very very appealing to me and I learned a great deal from it but I, I don't think it was um, it wasn't sort of personally aimed at all it was quite an impersonal public exercise of instruction but I was very very um, deeply affected by it and I was also I got a lot of confidence from it, which I didn't get from most of the other education I got in history in Cambridge, because they didn't, that didn't show me how to do anything that I wanted to be able to do, whereas he did show you how to do it. So John, if, if um, you, you, that was interesting you mentioned there about 
Moses Findlay as, as a profound influence. W was there anyone else who who had a, a formative impact on you as an undergraduate and postgrad at Cambridge? Um, well, I think the, uh, the, uh, there wasn't someone else who I would say had a very deep formative effect vertically in the way that Moses did. I mean, Moses was my teacher and uh, he definitely, I mean, I've, um, I'm just a continuation of his teaching really in many ways. Um, and that's a, quite a remarkable thing given who he was and where he came from and who I am and where I came from. Um, and it is actually a, an indication of the potential sort of transformative power of um, being taught by someone you're lucky to be taught by at an age when you can learn something. Um, I mean, there were two other people who in some ways were quite deep influences on me. Um, in my undergraduate and immediately um, uh, and early postgraduate uh, phase, but they were both uh, contemporaries. They weren't actually um, people, older scholars. There were some wonderful historians in Cambridge in my day. I mean, the Regis Professor of History, David Knowles, the great historian of the English religious orders and escaped Benedictine monk. Um, was a very, very remarkable figure. And there were several other very remarkable figures. And I, I did learn, I learned to understand enough about economic history to be able to sort of cope with the history tripods practically um, from, from uh, Munya Poston, the professor of economic history, who was a very, very brilliant um, uh, teacher also. Um, but that wasn't my sort of continuing major interest. It just was a, a, a major sort of support at the time. And both Quentin Skinner and I were very much uh, captured or captivated anyway um, by the special subject that um, Duncan Forbes taught on the Scottish Enlightenment in our final year as an undergraduate, which was a wonderful course on an absolutely fascinating and extraordinarily important um, historical um, happening. Um, and a happening which I suppose, I mean, uh, I, is, is at the center of the way that I see the, what's happened to the history of Western political thinking, although that certainly wasn't something that Duncan showed us, but I, I think um, he, he showed uh, us in a way how exciting it was and how um, impressive it was and that it was there. And uh, I think certainly I um, have gone on thinking about it in, from one angle or another. Um, ever since. Um, I didn't uh, do, do so um, on the basis of um, uh, what uh, Duncan showed me how to do in the way that I, in a way, sort of did everything a bit on the basis of what, how um, um, Moses showed me how to do things. Um, just, um, so can I just say who the two um, yeah horizontal influences. Were. Yes. <laughs> One of them, unsurprisingly, was Quentin Skinner, who was a fabulously gifted figure, um, and who was, um, as, as I said, um, a very close companion in a sort of um, a culture camp uh, that we, um, we were in at the time. But the other is someone um, not, as, uh, not as well known in um, I suppose the broader academic community, but actually a very, very great scholar indeed, and already actually a very remarkable scholar at that time, Michael Cook. I mean, one of the world's great Islamicists, and uh, the only person I know of who's won both the major sort of um, humanities um, uh, surrogates for the Nobel Prize, because there aren't any Nobel Prizes in the humanities. Um, I mean, he's an extraordinary person, and he was a very, very um, gentle, modest, um, shy um, intellectual companion, but he was extraordinarily intelligent, and he was very, very um, instructive, practically, in all sorts of ways for me. And uh, we complemented each other intellectually very, very well at that point. Um, he's gone on being an important touchstone for me in my life since. So. Um, I mean, the, the, those were two contemporaries who made a very big difference to me, really. Um, um, and and, and I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do believe that you 
uh, the three of you, uh, yourself, Quentin and um, Michael, got starred first. So you all you all distinguished yourselves in your finals. Is that correct? Actually, my case wasn't in my finals. That was in our second year. Okay. Um, and uh, the uh, the director of studies in history in Kings came round to Michael's in my room early in the morning to tell us that we both got starred first and that we were the first people in the college to get starred first in history since Eric Hobsbawm. So oh, <laughs> that was a good morning. Um, well, what does that mean? What, what, what do, like, there's a first and what's a starred first? I mean, is that, it's, it's a well, distinction, it, is it? It means it's a first that's really impressed the examiners. Um, okay. Uh, uh, they were very scarce in those days, as you can infer. And Eric Hobsbawm had been um, an undergraduate some time before me and Quentin, so they, that that showed that, <laughs> that uh, it was a you know wasn't wasn't the fish frequently caught. Yes, um, just the, if you could give us maybe a preview there. You mentioned the you know you did the Scottish Enlightened under Duncan Forbes, and you you felt that that was a very significant event. And it 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 had it had insights that you feel were, were were crucial, perhaps overlooked, but crucial. And you saw them even if Duncan didn't. Can you give us a preview of, of what where there where you where you think the significance lay in the, in the Scottish Enlightenment? Well, I think uh, I, do, I as I said, I don't know exactly that Duncan managed to get to clear in his head or and hence in my head exactly what the significance was but what he did convey very very effectively was that it was extraordinarily significant and very intellectually thrilling and um, very very distinctive i mean unlike what was happening anywhere else at that time uh, unlike something that had really happened anywhere else before and something which um, because of its, um, because of the breadth of uh, connected interest within it, um, had um, changed really the possibilities for thinking about um, uh, human society and politics. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, Duncan was an enthusiast and um, a rather intemperate man, um, and. Um, he he was um, he was very good at conveying the excitement, and he knew an enormous amount about it. And he saw um, the scale of its significance in a way that I don't think it was really seen by others outside Scotland. And in Scotland, it was seen in a way which which isn't um, in the end probably tremendously illuminating because it was just um, seen as the episode of national glory intellectually. Um, well, it was the episode of national glory intellectually, but that's not too interesting from the point of view of anyone who isn't Scottish. And it's mm. a question of how interesting it is even from a Scottish point of view. So I don't think that Duncan really, um, he didn't show the results of the Scottish Enlightenment in a way in which you could think on from those results into the future that lay ahead and think about that future in a strategic way, which you wouldn't have been able to if you hadn't seen. Um, and I, I think I acquired a sense of those um, really quite a lot later from the work that I did with this Van Hunt in Cambridge over, over you know, 30 years or so. Um, but I, I think this one really showed me why it was so. It, it was uh, such a synoptically illuminating way of looking at the subsequent history. Um, um, in that regard, do you think the Scottish Enlightenment was more intellectually rich than, well, the French Enlightenment? Yes, I mean, just briefly, <laughs> I'm afraid I do. Um, I mean, the French Enlightenment had, uh, you know, some very stellar figures in it, um, but it didn't have um, much in the way of a coherent vision of um, human society as a, you know, inhabited problem space moving through time. Um, and um, it, so I don't think it, I don't think it ever achieved um, across the set of people who, uh, allocated to it. I don't think it ever achieved a sort of coherent um, uh, 
I suppose, way of uh, synoptic um, vision of, of human history. And I think that um, in, insofar as um, it's sort of um, credited with that, I mean that the, what the vision it was credited with has proved to be very um, unhelpful in the longer run. Okay, that's interesting. And just for, for viewers that may not be familiar with, um, you know, the, the stellar figures of the Scottish Enlightenment, you're mainly referring, I imagine, to uh, David Hume and, and Adam Smith. Yes, that's right. I mean, there were a lot of other people who were impressive and important over quite a long period of time, I mean, definitely over a century altogether. But, um, I mean, the two sort of peak figures are definitely um, Smith and Hume. Um, okay. And Very good. Um, and then we, so you, they were kind of, that, that was kind of your undergraduate years. And then you, you obviously graduated with a great degree and you had the opportunity then to go to America uh, on a Harkner's Fellowship um, to Harvard University. I mean, that must have been a pretty exciting um, prospect. Did, did it live up to its uh, promise? Um, well, it had different kinds of promise. I mean, I, it, was, um, it, it was very exciting for, uh, I felt I'd rather sort of um, missed my adolescence, really. And I, it was an opportunity for a belated adolescence. I mean, we were given a car for um, um, six months to drive around the United States and we were paid very handsomely. And I didn't really have much in the way of um, uh, continuing responsibilities to Harvard. Um, and there were some, I had lots of introductions to exciting people from Isaiah Berlin and um, uh, Peter Lasso particularly. Um, uh, so I, you know, I, met, um, uh, I met John Rawls and Louis Hartz and um, Judith Schlar and um, various other people. Um, and I, you know, I got a lot out of um, Louis Hart. So I was supposed to be, my pretext for being in America at that point was that the PhD I was supposed to do, which did follow very directly really um, from, I wouldn't have done a PhD at all if I hadn't been interested in Duncan's special subject and it wouldn't have been on the history of political thought. Even if I had done one, I don't know what it would have been on, so that's why I wouldn't have done it. Um, but I actually meant to do my PhD on uh, the way in which Hume thought about political obligation. And I meant to do it with Duncan, but he didn't like the idea of that because he was trying to clarify his own thinking about uh, Hume. And I think he never sort of quite got there. So the idea of having someone um, ignorant and you know not that clear headed uh, and youthful sort of bumbling around in the foreground was an absolute nightmare from his point of view. So he de definitely, de definitely, I was admitted to do a PhD on Hume's theory of political obligation with him, but he, he, he definitely deflected me to Peter Laszlo, who had a, a, a voracious zest for having um, graduate students and always had dozens of things to, for them to do. And um, Peter, in effect, assigned me a, a task, which was to study um, what happened to Locke's political thinking in the 18th century in Britain and in America and in France, thinking of it as um, leading up to two revolutions and one non-revolution, all of which very consequential uh, from a subsequent point of view. Um, but um, I, and I, I did, I started off doing research on that in, in Cambridge and I did it for about a year and a half, I suppose. No, probably for two full years. And then I went to, uh, uh, to Harvard. Um, and uh, my pretext for going to Harvard was to do the American bit of that. And I did indeed do the American bit of that while I was at Harvard, which involved going around the United States, lots of archives and um, talking to lots of American colonial historians and um, uh, thinking about what I was finding out. Um, and I found out um, something which you know, certainly caused a lot of trouble, but, but, but actually I didn't think it was particularly interesting really. Um, I mean, it was very flustering for American um, received uh, opinion. 
about the history of political ideas in America and, and indeed the history of American politics. But um, it was frustrating because received opinion was sort of quite largely mistaken as a sort of myth. Um, and uh, it, it was uh, in a way sort of interesting finding out that it was a myth, but once you found it out, I mean, the interest lapsed abruptly. And I didn't want to go on with that, really. Um, so when I came back to Britain after Harvard, I thought, well, I won't uh, do a PhD on that. I wrote a long article while I was in, in the United States. Um, um, my supposed supervisor was Bernard Baden, who's, I think, regarded as probably the uh, leading historian of, um, of uh, that period of American history still. I mean, he, some weaknesses to his work if you look at it from some angles, but he was a very, very substantial figure. And he wasn't very interested in supervising me, but he was quite uh, sympathetic to me and quite helpful. Um, and um, he got me to give a, a, a talk quite early on in my research there, about halfway through, I suppose, to the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, which is a very sort of um, pompous institution. Um, with a grand mansion on Beacon Hill, um, and which meets sort of occasionally um, and you know, listens to scholarly papers about appropriate topics. And uh, it was full of grand American historians. And one of the people there was um, Samuel Morrison, who was the, you know, regarded as the leading American historian at that point. Um, so I gave my paper saying what I found out. Um, and um, they caused a certain amount of excitement in the discussion. Um, but I thought, well, that was that, really. I mean, I got everything I found out that I thought was really interesting was in that talk. So I published it a bit later. It's rather a long article. It wouldn't have gone in a journal even then, but um, I published it in a book. Um, and I thought, well, I, was, I, I wouldn't go on to um, document the sort of non consequentiality of Locke's political thought uh, for most of 18th century American political thinking because that, that, that would really be an immense weariness of the intellect and indeed flesh. Uh, but, and I thought I'd seen something important about Locke himself so I went back to Britain and I wrote out what I thought I'd seen. I tried to show how, um, how to understand Locke really. Um, and the way in which he saw politics, which I thought just simply wasn't understood at the time. That was interesting because if we look at your book on Locke from two perspectives, first of all, the approach you took to, uh, to his political thought, and then the insights that approach generated. Um, so your approach was very different to the standard conventional approach of, of analytic philosophy, uh, historians of philosophy. You see to put history first rather than, you know, philosophy first in that conventional way. So could you maybe say a little bit about what was distinctive about your approach to Locke before we look at the substantive insights it generated? Yeah, I think what was distinctive about it was, the, in a sense, central to the um, position that Quentin and I sh shared in this cultural war. I mean, um, I, um, I thought my approach was uh, centered on trying to understand Locke and philosophers' approach was uh, centered on trying how to show that they were um, you know, cleverer or anyway, sort of more correct than Locke, I mean, depending uh, on the philosopher. Um, and I thought, um, I thought actually that was a really silly thing to do, but which is, obviously there are two opinions about that. But but um, I thought whether or not that was a silly thing to do, it certainly was a bit impertinent of the philosophers to show how much more intelligent or correct they were than Locke, while not bothering to understand Locke. And I thought that, uh, what what Quentin and I were claiming to do was to. Um, give the past its due, I mean, to acknowledge its uh, having been there <laughs> in its uh, uh, full density. I mean, obviously, you can't actually capture its full density, um, but um, 
it's different to try to capture it than you know not even to pretend to try to capture it but to um, proceed to sort of condescend um, on the basis of your own um, intellectual um, qualities I mean to this um, straw figure and, and did you just to stick on that particular methodolo methodological point for uh, for a little bit further did you feel that you and Quentin were were fighting a two-man war against everyone else? Was it a difficult period? I mean, were you getting much reception? Um, were people scoffing at this approach, or how? How did what, what was it? What did it feel like taking this approach? Well, I think it probably did help us both quite a lot that we were both taking it i mean i think we had a you know an unwarranted um, sort of juvenile um, cockiness about it but but um it was much easier to sustain that as it were in the face of um <laughs> the enemy um because there were two of us um and we did uh, we, we we certainly were bloody condescending in our own way i mean we thought that a lot of what people say, were saying was sort of obvious idiocy and all you had to do was to listen to it carefully and point out what it meant to show how obviously idiotic it was um, and I mean that gave us quite a lot of confidence I mean we were confident in our negative judgment and I think we had um, you know I still think we had uh, overwhelming reason for that confidence um, I mean that didn't show us as it were what to do with what we did manage to find, and I didn't have a conviction about what it was appropriate to do with it. I just thought um, it, it was a, a helpful intervention to, put, to stand up for the past uh, as, as itself uh, and see what happened, really. Um, That's interesting because, because when you, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree with the contextual approach in, in its critique of conventional history of philosophy. That was kind of pointless and condescending. Um, and, but what's very impressive, I think, about the Cambridge School, it, it, it isn't just methodologically interesting, and it wasn't just a, a negative war. It produced great, great work, which actually almost justified the methodological suspicions it had. Um, and when we look at your book on the political thought of John Locke, not only did it exemplify the new methodology, but it, it showed new insights that can come from that that were really interesting and that could only have emerged from uh, a genuinely historical approach to John Locke. So could you maybe share with us what some of those insights were? What were the key insights that you arrived at uh, in writing that book? I think what I saw and what I was confident um, uh, mattered. Um, was <clears throat> that um, the way in which Locke imagined um, human life and the place of politics inside human life depended on his seeing the, the universe as a created um, and comprehensively intended outcome of divine, of the power of a an omnipotent and beneficent creator. And I think the, um, the fundamental structural um, engineering of Locke's thinking depended on that. And Locke himself actually does say that quite explicitly. Um, and I thought, um, I thought A, that I'd seen that and B, that um, it might actually carry to people to point out that he actually said it if they just bothered to read what he said. He didn't say it on page one of the essay concerning human understanding or, or the two traditions of government. So it, it did involve trying to um, use what happens to be, by good fortune, a very, very rich archive on Locke. I mean, there's an enormous amount of material about Locke's life. Um, and about his intellectual development. Um, and uh, I 
I mean, when, obviously, Quentin and my uh, approach required us to use all the material we could possibly find that might be relevant and to, um, to probe carefully into things which didn't necessarily initially look at all promising. So in that sense, we had a sort of uh, historians um, in presupposition that, that um, it was worth, um, you know, getting your hands dirty uh, in trying to find out. Um, and that obviously stylistically was really the opposite extreme from the um, uh, the Oxford philosophy um, bit of BPE. Um, and uh, I think, um, I mean, I would say that actually in that sense, my, my book, um, All Its Weaknesses, I mean, is a kind of proof that we were right and that they were wrong. Um, because even even sort of Rawls nowadays, um, you know, of course he's dead now, but I mean in his later um, writings, I mean even Rawls acknowledged that actually it was really important that that was the way in which Locke thought. I didn't quite see what it meant, but I mean he saw that it was true and that it must in some sense matter. Um, and actually the people who uh, think it doesn't matter um, are, um, I mean, they're not really uh, serious intellectual um, uh, figures. I mean, they're not people with whom you could uh, profitably think. Um, I mean, they, there are still quite a lot of them, but I mean, they don't have reasons for their belief. They, it's just a habit. Well, those, well, those people, without mentioning necessary names, where do you, why do you think they were quite sensitive? What were they, what were they protecting that your book was endangering? Well, I think they were protecting, I mean, uh, their own um, very complacent sense of um, the, um, the sort of basis of their own values and self-perception. Um, I mean, it, the people in Britain who, for whom uh, Locke is, uh, a, uh, was at that time, or for long term is now, a sort of um, a stru structuring um, element are uh, rather few and far between. But um, it, it isn't, um, I mean, it, it wasn't ridiculous for um, the American intellectual historian Merle Curti to write a long article uh, called jo John Locke America's philosopher, and it wasn't um, ridiculous for uh, Louis Hartz. Well, it was slightly ridiculous, but it wasn't completely ridiculous for Louis Hartz to say that uh, American political thought simply consisted of spelling out John Locke. Um, and, and certainly, it was false that it consisted of, uh, on spelling out, in spelling out uh, John Locke that there actually was. <laughs> but but, but, but it, um, it it is a way of seeing. I mean, the, a certain sort of parochial narrowness in American political um, perception and uh, evaluation over a very long time. Um, mm. So I thought it was a reasonable historical perception. Louis Hartz was a very interesting figure. It was a bit um, mad, but. Um, he, he, he was a, he was a very um, vivid person, and he was very clever and very serious, and he did have some quite deep intuitions. Um, I mean, he sort of um, wouldn't be a bad thing for Americans to look at him again and think a bit about what was going on in his thinking. Um, Interesting that so you 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 wrote your book on Locke. It was serious scholars. Well, they were, uh, had to take it seriously, and, and as you say, it was a kind of a, a, a demonstration of the Cambridge School or the contextual school in, in practice, and it, it was a kind of a vindication, really, of the methodology. And I, I suppose Quentin Skinner's had been doing work on, on Hobbes, and then much later his book on the foundations of political thought, modern political thought, which again was a further vindication of the Cambridge School. Um, now, a lot of people probably would have thought you would have stayed in the history of ideas following your book on Locke, but you don't do that. You actually then take what would look like, superficially anyway, at least, as a very different uh, left move. You, you, you do a book on revolution. Um, 
so can you explain why you did that um, and, and what fascinated you about revolutions and was there anything in your methodology that helped you understand the causes and development of revolutions? Well, I suppose the thing which did help me wasn't exactly in my methodology, but it was just simply a consequence of the fact that I'd studied history as an undergraduate and I was supposed to be teaching other people how to study it. Um, but I mean, the, the interest in revolution, I mean, the um, political character of that interest, I mean, was, it went back to, um, in a sense, I suppose, before I got to Cambridge, but it, it went back to what I uh, was trying to convey about the impact of, in particular of India on me. I mean, if you, um, in uh, late adolescence, come to see the world as, um, the human world is devastatingly uh, unjust and very, very grim for a lot, very large percentage of human beings. Um, it is natural to wonder um, not just how it got to be like that, but uh, how far it actually has to be like that. And I thought about it from then on, and I thought about politics from then on, in terms of how far it's possible to amend that, really. And I suppose I still do. Um, so that's a continuity of perspective, really, and sense, weak sense, purpose. Um, but um, I mean, it, it's an accident that I spent any time working on revolution. And I didn't initially actually work on revolution, really. I ran a seminar in King's with another um, fellow of the college, quite well known for other reasons subsequently, Martin Bernal, um, the son of J.D. Bernal, uh, so a figure who came from the sort of um, high left intellectual aristocracy uh, and a, a sort of maximally transgressive bit of that. Um, so, and Martin was a very gifted person. He was a very, um, a very nice person. He was a very um, good, congenial intellectual companion. And King's was very rich at that point. So you could, if you were a, a young fellow and you wanted to, um, uh, to, to inquire into something, and especially if there happened to be two of you, um, you could get the college to pay for your education to some degree. So we ran a seminar together about a set of revolutions, um, as it were, each of us taking one. Um, and um, there were a, a, not a huge number of people in it, but there were, I suppose there were uh, sort of eight or nine people in it at various points. Um, and obviously Martin took the Chinese Revolution um, and um, a college, subsequent colleague of mine, John Barber, a historian of the Soviet Union, um, took the Russian Revolution, a pupil of, doctoral pupil of E.H. Carr. Um, and um, uh, no, there were a number of other people, but um, some of them sociologists, but um, one person who joined us in the later stages and took the Yugoslav uh, revolution subsequently became a very well-known and uh, important economist, Nick Stern. Um, and he was just starting to do economics. He had read maths and he was uh, doing his master's degree in economics when he was in the seminar with us. And it was very interesting. And at the end of the seminar, it lasted about a year or so, I suppose, we got the money from the college to have a small international seminar about revolution, to which we were allowed to invite anyone we had the um, uh, arrogance to invite, I suppose. Um, so uh, we had, uh, for on the Russian Revolution, we had E.H. Carr and we had Mark Farrow, mm. who was the great French historian of the Russian Revolution at that time. And on the Chinese Revolution, we had a, a very interesting uh, historian called Lucien Bianco. Um, and we, we had a lot of people, and Eric Hobsbawm came in. We had, um, and uh, it, <coughs> the seminar was in, um, I can't remember exactly which month it was, but it was in uh, the very near vicinity of May 1968. So it was an exciting time to think about it. Um, and um, 
I don't think I actually took any of the revolutions particularly. I just um, uh, joined in the discussion of what we were learning rather extensively. Um, and um, I mean, that might easily have been that. Um, and the only reason it wasn't that was because when Cambridge very belatedly decided that it was going to have politics as a, 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 an under, a component of an undergraduate degree, um, which was in um, about a year and a half later than that, um, the, the politics bit of the degree had uh, four papers, four tripos papers, that's the way edu education was organised in Cambridge, and uh, it didn't have anyone to teach them, um, but it had undergraduates taking them. And one of the four um, was a paper on revolution, and nobody wanted to teach that. Um, so I thought, well, perhaps I'll teach that. I mean, you know, I thought about it. it's very interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll talk, I'll, I'll lecture about it, and I'll learn something from doing so. So I settled down to it, and I learned something from doing it. And uh, I did it in the way that you sort of would do it if you read history as an undergraduate. But I thought, you know, these are episodes in particular places over particular spans of time and if you're going to understand what happened in them you need to understand them that way and I didn't have a um, definite as it were view about what I might hope to learn to have learned from studying all of them I, and I was I didn't uh, was done in a bit of a rush so I was you know I was uh, I wasn't ever two revolutions ahead, if you see what I mean. <laughs> um, so I, anyway, I gave the course of lectures. And then um, the next year, um, the university allocated um, uh, two new jobs to this new um, teaching structure. But neither of the jobs was in politics. And I thought, well, I'm bloody well not going to do this again if they don't even think they need to employ people to do this. Um, uh, so I thought, well, I, I, I wonder if it's, I could make a book out of it, because um, I thought it had been very interesting from my point of view, and I thought probably it could be interesting. It's a time when a lot of people are thinking about revolution. I thought it, was a, it could be interesting for other people. And it was actually much my most successful book. I and mean, it was very interesting for lots of people, obviously, when it came out. Um, and it, because it interested lots of people and sort of got about the place, um, got about the place in ways which weren't, uh, I mean, wholly reassuring, I must say. I learned at one point in one week that it had been it was being used as a set text in the South African Defence Academy and that um, it had just been translated under a special security classification by the Soviet Academy of Sciences with a, a distribution list confined to people high up in the party hierarchy. So, I, I, so, but obviously there, but there, there was an interesting revolution in, in both settings at the time. Um, and um, in a way, I mean, the, the, um, I think it's true that that book has lasted quite well. I mean, if you look at it again now, and you think, well, what have people managed to do about revolutions um, as a political category and a, a set of um, diverse historical experiences since then. I mean, how, how is revolution as a category to think about politics through um, come out over the subsequent, um, uh, well, now 48 years? Um, I think the answer is, well, actually, there isn't uh, some sort of dramatic advance um, that you can find, uh, which will tell you uh, what you probably want to know. Um, and it, it is a more instructive um, framing to begin from, probably, than the other framings that have come up since then, really. Um, I, quite, I think that, that struck me about that book and about, well, all your books, really, is like most historians and you did history are not very i'm making a generalization now are not very theoretically self-conscious um and yet your books are 
Now, I know they're in politics, uh, and probably political theory by its very nature is more theoretically self-conscious, but you came to it from history. Um, um, what's always been a bit of a puzzle to me is, how did you acquire your theoretical sophistication, if I may put it that way? Um, I mean, your book on Locke is methodologically sophisticated, and then your book on revolutions, which, as you say, you kind of fell into, um, and a revolution was in the air and it kind of took off. But it's it's not just historically informed, it's it's theoretically nuanced. How did you, is that just something you picked up or was that like the influence of Moses Findlay? How, how did you do that? I suppose I just simply wanted to understand and I, I, I hung out with very clever people for quite a long time. First did so really um, at school at Winchester for a couple of years and uh, most in very sort of um, challenging intellectual community I've ever belonged to, the college at Winchester. Um, but um, I, I, I wanted to understand and I was sort of um, shown by other people really. I mean, that's, that's a difficult thing to do, not an easy thing to do. And you need to try hard. So I've just tried hard. Obviously I've tried varying, with varying degrees of um, energy, but I, I, I tend to try hard. I mean, I don't see the point as it were as being varying unless you try pretty hard. Um, and that forces you into thinking about um, what you're doing and um, how you're doing it. Um, forces you to um, be alert to the process of inquiry um, in, and the relationship between conclusions and um, uh, yes, the, what you might think of as evidence. Um, yes, because you're kind of, you, a lot of your books are kind of pioneering a trail. There's no template. You know, it's clear you're not working from a, from a, a template uh, where a lot of scholars either because they're lazy or they just don't have the intellectual wherewithal to actually blaze a trail um so you, you, you with, that, with your books you feel you're actually writing it from from the start from scratch with you've you know you've got certain theoretical presuppositions but not much you're looking at the evidence fresh um which makes them impressive and and then I, I, this kind of brings us on then, to, I suppose, to the next section of your career. You, you finished your book on on revolutions. You, as you say, it became a very popular book. Um, and then you kind of get more into critiquing uh, political thought in a kind of a general way, uh, both historically and um, contemporary political theory. Can you maybe talk a little bit about about that? Um, yes, I mean, that, that was in a way quite accidental too. Um, I, um, I mean, I would say you, if you look at <coughs> what I've uh, published over the decades, I mean, the, the, what you would uh, describe that way sort of begins with um, Western political theory in the face of the future. And that was a completely accidental happening also. It, it happened, I was asked by... Um, uh, two uh, philosophers at uh, University College London, Richard Volheim and Miles Burnett. Miles Burnett was a contemporary of mine, the Kings. Um, I was asked to give some lunchtime talks in the Architectural Association, which was the sort of uh, high snob architectural um, education institution in London at the time, and was sort of just next door to UCL. Um, and uh, I was given some topics to, uh, give, to give the talks about, and one of them was democracy, and one of them was liberalism, and one of them was nationalism. Well, I, I had thought a bit about uh, democracy in, in Greece because of Moses, because that's one of the things we did together. Um, and it had been a, ve a very, very rich experience. Um, so I had something to start off from, and, and then I just thought, well, I'll try and see, I mean, how... Um, what happens as it were as you move towards now. Um, and I picked up the point that, um, I mean, I, my intuition about 
now, as of then, I mean, say about the mid 1970s, um, was that um, this is a um, this is a term of piety, and um, a term which um, it would be discreditable to um, disavow or to express hostility to. Uh, but it wasn't a term which um, applied in any very um, precise way to anything. Um, so I thought I'll think about that. Um, and I talked about it uh, and I told the um, architectural students uh, a certain amount about it. And um, then the next week I had, went, had to go on to liberalism. Well, I, in a way, I I'd never particularly thought about liberalism as a category before that. But I thought, well, um, there is a sort of, you know, you can think of it, even then you could think about it as the sort of um, uh, very, very um, generalized uh, um, picture of um, uh, sort of political and social um, value um, in um, <laughs> respectable circles. Um, and I thought, well, um, I'll try and uh, show them sort of what it is that that's, uh, that, that, that consists in and where it's come from. And, uh, and then I, and the third thing I was asked to talk about was nationalism. So I said, no, I hadn't really thought about nationalism at all. I was brought up in a very um, nationalist British family um, and uh, at a very nationalist British time. I was a child of the war. Um, but I, um, I mean, my experiences, I think, already in a little bit, even in Germany, but certainly in Iran and um, and in um, India, especially recollected in tranquility, had been very sort of um, uh, corrosive of nationalism. <laughs> so I'd, I wasn't a fan of nationalism, um, and I thought about it. Some intellectual history, I mean. Uh, from a position of, um, yes, I mean, some um, distaste, I suppose it would just be fair to say. So I gave those talks and I wrote them out on cards, I suppose. Um, uh, and then I <coughs> was asked to go and give a, a set of uh, visiting lectures for an encouraging sum of money in Canada, in, in um, Vancouver. So I had to give lectures about something. And I thought, well, actually, the, the, this stuff is probably more interesting than me talking at length about Locke. And um, I thought, well, I hadn't really, um, I hadn't sort of got very far with my uh, African work. And um, I, I, I had to give four lectures, so three were insufficient. So I gave a let the fourth lecture was about the other thing that I thought about that I people turned out to be interested in, which was revolution. So that's, as it were, what explains the content of Western political theory in the face of the future. Um, uh, and I gave the lectures and they went well in, in Vancouver. Um, and then they the, the my host thought, well, it would be nice if um, the university uh, press there published them. Um, uh, but the university press there didn't actually particularly relish the thought of publishing them. And I think, you know, publish would have been a strong verb to use if it had published them. I don't think I've seen them. Yes, well, I, I haven't seen many volumes from the University of British Columbia Press, if it's still trading. Um, but uh, I, at that point, I'd published uh, uh, four books, actually, with Cambridge University Press, and I was a close friend of one, one of the editors. And the books had all done well from Cambridge University Press's point of view. So they were sympathetic, even from a sort of business angle. And my friend was sympathetic from a rather different angle, I suppose, as well. Um, and. Um, so I showed them to her and said, do you, do you think this could be a book? And she said, yeah, I think it could be a book. It would be good if it was a book. I mean, let's publish it. Um, so they did, and it was a success again. I mean, it uh, reached a lot of people. It 
attracted um, sort of, I suppose, um, you know, attracted a nice review from Alistair McIntyre. That was a very um, good battle honour from my point of view, so he had been a real intellectual hero of mine. Um, and um, it, uh, it got about. Yeah. It's it's interesting that you know um, because that book I, I didn't know the, obviously the background to that book um, I, I've read it a few times obviously I got a lot of instruction from it it was very important it was one of the very important books to me when I was um, an undergraduate trying to make sense of political theory and um, the couple of things that struck me about it was again it was it was not second hand. Um, the second thing I think was that it was pretty withering in its critique of political theory and political ideologies, if you want. Um, you know, after you read the chapter on liberalism, there, there wasn't much left. <laughs> it, um, you, you felt, oh, well, th there's no room for complacency here. We have to actually rebuild the, uh, the house um, that Locke didn't build, you know. <laughs> and then... Um, the other thing, though, that struck me as well was that it was um, the title, Western Political Theory in the Face of the Future. You, you were concerned with the future. Uh, you weren't looking back. You were looking back, obviously, to write what you wrote because you gave it a historical dimension. But the future was obviously on your mind. Well, it's always been on my mind because I started off from a picture of a very drastically... Um, unjust and grim human world and the question of whether it can be um, made uh, less unjust and less grim. Um, you know, those are actually of course rather different questions and uh, bits of it have in a way been made, made less grim as it were so far for a lot of people um, in my lifetime but um, it certainly hasn't been made less unjust in my lifetime, that's for sure. Um, and of course, uh, a lot else has happened, and I didn't uh, foresee, um, I didn't foresee the scale of ecological catastrophe. Um, perhaps slightly more tuned in terms of sensibility to the idea of ecological loss because of my peculiar um, parental life world, but. Um, I, I certainly hadn't uh, got any sort of um, sort of premature Rachel Carson, I mean, vision of us having, of humans having wrecked their world, um, which we should have now, really. Um, I think there, well, yes, I mean, we, we didn't know back then, um, although we do know now that vital decisions could have been made in the late 70s, early 80s, that might have, at the very least, um, restrained or held back some of the horrendous impact of ecological um, decline. But um, one, you mentioned there Alistair McIntyre's review of your book, and I remember reading that review. I think it was in the London Review of Books. Yes. And something that struck me, I mean, it, it was a very complimentary review, um, uh, but he said something I remember in that review where he says, you know, doing political theory is really difficult because it, 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 you have to be, you know, you have to do a bit of history, you have to do a bit of sociology, you have to do politics, you have to be philosophical or theoretically sophisticated. And he did kind of say, I mean, about, only about three or four people have kind of pulled this off. And he said, your book was one of them now, but he, he did mention, I think, I think he said Isaiah Berlin. I know you have disagreements with Isaiah Berlin, but he did say, you know, this is a really difficult thing to do. Now, Alistair McIntyre was humble enough not to put himself in that category, but I think he was clearly, when you read his book After Virtue, which I think was a wonderful book, he again showed the, the very rare skills you are, that are required to write really good political theory. Um, can you say something about how difficult good political theory is to write? Um, well, it... I think the first point really is it's very, very difficult to think. And um, the, 
I mean, I agree with what Alistair said in that uh, review. I, I think it requires you to try to um, uh, register the weight of an enormous range of um, information um, and to um, register it as accurately as you can. Um, I mean, that is a very um, sort of punitive assignment for a practicing academic. And I mean, one of the reasons why my work is really very different from most other people's is that I got into a, um, I sort of escaped from the torturable class very early on in academic life. I had a secure job in a very fine university um, before I was in my um, mid thirties. And I wasn't really intellectually answerable to anyone else at all from then on. So I could um, follow my own trail. Um, and um, I suppose what I, what I learned um, in doing so is just that the trail um, goes very, very steadily up. It gets more and more um, arduous, it, the air gets thinner and thinner. Um, and, um, but of course, it's also true that um, the view as you go up, it gets um, more instructive um, if you have the um, obstinacy uh, to, to persist, um, you know, your bugs hold up. Um, so uh, I, I, I do think that, that um, it's just right that if you want to um, think seriously about politics, you really do have to think seriously and it's no use thinking you can polish off bits of it in an insulated way and just um, pile them up. It's not like that. No, and I think that's, there's a couple of things you, you, you kind of say there that I think that are, are germane. Um, you mentioned there, when I mean, there's certain things that help that happen, that you can think that way. And one of them is obviously your institution allowing you to do that, uh, to think, you know, laterally and not just narrowly. Um, I, and, you know, when, and I'm wondering when I look at, well, periodicals like the London Review book, or the New York Review books, or what public intellectuals are doing today uh, and what they're not doing today that I think was being done more in the 70s, 80s, 90s, was there seems to be a poverty of Renaissance people around that have that synoptic view. Um, like the likes of Alistair McIntyre, Bernard Williams, um, those sort of intellectuals that could had a huge range and they had that range because they were at, they were using every sinew that they had to get that range. Um, but there seems to be now, everything's very, very compartmentalized. And as a result, the book, it's not very interesting. Um, and therefore it's not, and it's also not very insightful. Um, so there's not books being published today i mean there are a few great scholars around but there i think there are there, there's much fewer of them um is this something you've registered or do you think we we you know that the high tide of intellectual life was was probably back then for those sort of thinkers like yourself and the alistair mcintyres the richard rorty's who could uh, who had that kind of span I think it requires a, a much more adventurous um, uh, spirit and um, <laughs> possibly a very large private income uh, to be uh, uh, as adventurous as it was quite easy for us to be existentially. Um, I mean, I don't think Alistair's life can ever have been particularly easy because of his personality, but it, but it, um, it, it was um, wonderfully strenuous. I mean, and the strenuousness sort of lasted a 
fantastically long time. So <laughs> it was possible then, and heaven knows how it was possible for him. I have a better understanding, obviously, of how it was possible for me. Um, and um, I think it, it, it's, at a certain level, it isn't possible now, unless people have a very, very, um, uh, unless they have an independent position, really, uh, outside the institutions. Um, and I think you, you know, it's, you, can't, you can't dare um, be, um, you can't dare sort of um, let go of the rope and <laughs> see what happens. You, 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 you had to stay um, on the ledge <laughs> and you have to um, be very careful where you put your foot. Um, I just think it, it's not that people are um, dispositionally, um, you know, more cowardly now and were um, dispositionally braver and grander then. Um, but it was much less um, expensive to be reasonably brave then. Okay. I mean, the when, when you look back at that time, I mean, and I read, you know, your books that were coming out at that time, they were, they were pretty eclectic in their interests. I mean, you were, you know, you were writing about Richard Rorty's, you know, philosophy and the mirror of nature. And you were, you you, you know, your range was pretty wide. Um, what thinkers back then do you think were really inspiring you and, 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 uh, were, were filling you with insight that you felt was being was helpful for your own work? Well, there were obviously people who were dead. Um, I mean, Collingwood was very important for Quentin and for me. Um, and actually Bernard rather came round to Collingwood in his um, later work. Um, yeah, and just simply the idea that it's all interrogation. And that means that you're an interrogator, and it means you're, <laughs> that's what you have to do, and you have to acknowledge that you're doing it, you have to acknowledge it's you doing it, so you're pretending it's being sort of done um, by um, capture of a you know, special um, technical competence. Um, yeah, I, I did get a great deal out of Alistair. Um, I got a certain amount out of Charles Taylor. I, I got a bit out of Richard Rorty, not, not on the whole on sort of um, social and political thinking. I thought he was rather a sort of sentimental muddle about that really, but, but I thought he was very interesting philosophically. Um, and um, I, I got, as it were, the, um, the exciting period in his thought rather than um, <laughs> the bit which Bernard sort of turned his um, his guns on at the end. I mean, the sort of um, <laughs> the sort of terminal irresponsibility, um, <laughs> which was more personal, I think. Um, I mean, that Bernard uh, Bernard Williams was a very very um, uh, unpriggish person, but at a certain level. He, he was capable of very violent intellectual disapproval. <laughs> and, and his philosophy was very, I mean, his philosophy and his um, propensity for violent intellectual disapproval were impacted very strongly on each other. I mean, it was, um, it, it really upset him um, how, for people to, um, to combine being sort of smug and evasive, really, as he saw it, and uh, it really drove him wild. Um, I mean, not that uh, that's a very good psychological description, because he wasn't you know, on the wild side, but um, uh, I mean, he, it really, really got to him. And, and you would have probably got to know Bernard quite well then. I mean, he was both Knightsbridge or Knightbridge Professor of Philosophy, which meant he was a fellow of King's, and he was also then Provost of King's College which you've been associated with for your entire life. I mean, so you got to know Bernard, I imagine, pretty well then. Well, I think how well I knew him probably wasn't stable over time, but there certainly was a time in which I knew him very well. Um, and um, it was about the time at which he um, 
began uh, with his um, second wife, um, and um, who was a friend of mine, um, and I think probably my then wife and uh, and I were the closest people in Cambridge to him at that point. Um, uh, and I, he was a remarkable provost, uh, and uh, he, um, I was, uh, I, I was the person who um, made the speech proposing him for provost. So I was very um, implicated in his being provost, I suppose. And I didn't like all the ways in which he behaved as provost, but I, I. I was very fond of him and I was intellectually very grateful to him. He was a, a, an extraordinarily uh, illuminating um, intellectual critic and he was very patient really in, uh, in, in trying to show me how not to um, fall over my feet. I mean, philosophically at a time when I was trying actually to, to cope with philosophy um, more consecutively than at other times. Um, and we, I mean, we did share a lot of interests and um, I, in his later um, period after he left Cambridge, um, um, particularly after he went back to Oxford and when he was thinking a lot more about politics. I mean, uh, um, he and I agreed a great deal about what politics um, is. I mean, what you have to try to understand and try and reckon with. Um, and on the, um, in a way, sort of eliminatory uh, character of that when you apply it to uh, most modern political philosophy. So um, um, we, were talk we talked a lot about how to show that, really. Um, I don't think I was ever sort of very practically intellectually helpful to him, but I, I mean, because what he was trying to do, I don't think he did succeed in doing, and I don't see it that anyone else is doing either but but um i think that we um shared very definitely an intuition about what it was what was the standard by which uh, contemporary political philosophy was abjectly failing mm. and we were trying to clarify that from our respective angles and so in that sense we did really have a very uh, we had uh, sort of intersecting intellectual purposes. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, in one way, I, um, I mean, I've, I've always been enormously impressed with Bernard Williams. It, it was just clear he had such a brilliant mind and, and was so quick. Um, in fact, I heard an anecdote from someone who said that they said to him one day, he was talking to this person. He, the person said, I, I can't keep up with you. And, uh, and Bernard said, well, why would you? <laughs> uh, and I, I would say, it seems typically a Bernard Williams comment. But, um, but actually Bernard was, when I was, um, I, I, I abandoned academia. I, I was teaching political theory in Trinity for about six or seven years. And I abandoned it largely because of something I read that, that Thomas Nagel says, that Bernard said, so unless you're, really clever or you're going to say something original there's no point in being doing political philosophy or political theory or doing philosophy and that for me kind of finished me off because I couldn't see myself fulfilling either of those criteria but um but I think more probably more interestingly um there's two things about Bernard's work that really strikes me it's it's the first thing is he's such his criticism of, you know, kind of conventional political and moral theory is pretty devastating. Um, and there's not much left if you take it seriously. And he gives you every reason to take it seriously. And then it was only, you feel, at, towards the end of his career that something more constructive emerges. Uh, th there are hints of it in ethics and the limits of philosophy, especially in the last the last the epilogue i believe or the last chapter and then it kind of emerges then with you know his essays and especially then truth and truthfulness um and what's again it, it it's not very easy to pinpoint 
what the constructive thing is. It, 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 it's, it's, again, it reinforces that this is a really difficult thing to do. You don't, you know, if you want to find 10 insights on political philosophy, there's no such insights. You don't find it at the back of the book. Uh, the wisdom that Bernard conveyed is, is, is very elusive. Um, do you think he kind of exemplified what genuine political philosophy is in that way? Well, I think he exemplified what genuine philosophy is. I mean, I think that he was um, was um, profoundly um, motivated um, to judge what there is good reason to believe and what it's um, defensible to say. And he was... Um, a very, very imaginative, as well as a fabulously clever um, explorer of those questions. Um, and he, um, he was always, I think, confident that he was um, a lot cleverer about than most of his um, uh, contemporaries and um, or the sense of people alive at the same time, um, and that he was, um, that he could um, sort of outthink any of them if he bothered to. Um, but I think he, um, it was difficult for him to set himself to um, try to get somewhere. I don't think that was an easy thing for him to do. And in a way, I suppose it just is true that truth and truthfulness is um, uh, Bernard's sort of intellectual um, testament. Um, and, um, you know, maybe it isn't, uh, maybe it's not as brilliant a book as it might have been if he'd written it 20 years earlier, but he wasn't in a position to write it 20 years earlier wasn't existentially there yet. Um, and I suppose um, when he began, I mean, philosophy was a, a sort of dashing way of intellectual life in the circles in which he moved. And he was the most dashing of them, really. Um, and um, he, he was... Um, well, he enjoyed that enormously, uh, and he enjoyed the continuing company of a lot of the people who he'd known then, and they subsequently accrued company of a lot of other people uh, of the same sort of um, you know, intellectual um, vitality and you know, reach. Um, but he um, he didn't. He wasn't a um, collaborator. He didn't work with anyone else, really. Um, in a way, I mean, I don't know what would have happened if he'd stayed in Cambridge. I mean, uh, whether in fact we would actually have got much closer to actually working together on the, what he was most preoccupied with at the end. Um, but um, certainly I wouldn't have been able to um, help him um, philosophically. I mean, maybe I might have been some help in thinking about um, how to pin down what it is that um, uh, political philosophy nowadays fails to measure up to. Um, of course, you can say, well, it has failed to measure up to that, hasn't it? But um, uh, I wouldn't myself agree with that view, I think, in a certain different ways. I mean, it hasn't just failed to measure up to it at various um, you know, rather whimsically distributed points in the past, um, not as the um, intellect, sort of achieved intellectual um, uh, competence of a lot of people, but as the um, perceptions of a very small number of people. Um, in a way, I mean, Bernard, Bernard was too clever to settle for, um, yeah, settle for a 
an achievement which was um, wasn't very very high up in the mountain range and um, I don't think he got there but I mean extraordinarily few human beings have so it's not surprising he got a hell of a long way up the mountain range um, you know, by Yes, yeah, so you, you get the impression with Bernard Williams that the only person who might have been his equal was Frederick Nietzsche. Um, so, although I did hear a rumor once that he did, he did find himself in the company of Noam Chomsky once, and he he did say apparently that oh I I've eventually met someone who comes near to being <coughs> who comes near to being my peer. <laughs> yes, but, only man could have said that, as it were, and with the, the accompanying smirk. <laughs> but, yeah. But, um, um, yes, well, actually, I mean, no, I know Chomsky is a, you know, dispersed entity, um, especially by now. But, um, and I don't understand the linguistics, or I don't know whether it was a sort of huge lurch forward, or whether actually it turned out to be a a bit of a sort of um, mirage, but um, the the um, what's certainly true is that Chomsky, as it were, <laughs> um, auditioned by ordinary agents um, in the in the in the period I was um, in the United States and shortly afterwards was a very very fine public intellectual critic of the um, American catastrophe. Um, mm -hmm when it was really um, <clears throat> sort of beginning to happen seriously. I mean, um, so, I mean, yeah, he was very, very gifted. I mean, in some sense, he must still be very, very gifted. I think he's repetitive now. But, um, yes, I mean, I think um, we, 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 what, we're, what I think we, maybe to get things back on track with your own work is, um, and it actually touches on something about Bernard Williams as well. I mean, I think Bernard, Bernard's work became much more interesting, I think, when he took the historical turn really seriously. And I think that kind of happened in the 70s. And uh, there's, you could speculate, speculate about the, why that occurred, but his, his work becomes much more sceptical and you could say realistic um, from the 70s onwards. It, it had a certain kind of naïve confidence about it, analytic confidence in the 50s and 60s. It was still brilliant but it didn't have that kind of scepticism and recognition of, of contingency and the insights that contingency have or should have for philosophy and theory generally. But if we go back to you now, John, um, one of the things we didn't really talk about and you actually hinted at when we were talking about um, Western political theory was your work on, on Africa. Um, and can you maybe say a little bit about how you got into that and what it, what it kind of, the insights it, it, that emerge from your work. <clears throat> yes, I mean, I, I, um, I had um, because of my um, family background and my um, experiences um, where I got to Cambridge. I had um, a, a very keen interest in what uh, was happening in parts of the world, which had been. Um, incorporated into the British or other European empires. Um, and I um, thought uh, that um, what political theorists might um, be most sensible to try to do um, at any particular time was to try to understand the significance of um, relatively new phenomena which are quite you know, quite widespread because uh, there would be uh, the opportunity to um, try to see them um, early on in their being within sort of potential visual space and there would be enough of them to permit as it were some sort of serious um, cognitive processing um, so I thought that what I would do um, would be to um, switch over really from working as a historian of political thought 
um, from my own research, to uh, think about post-colonial states. I thought there were lots and lots of them. It's obvious that people don't understand what that means at all. Um, there are must be some um, generalities to what it means, um, but actually it's difficult to think about them without um, getting um, quite seriously. This is the sort of history tripos. I mean, <laughs> striking back again uh, without getting uh, really inside one of them. So I mean, I thought I I'll, I I read a lot of American. Um, uh, modernization theory, comparative politics. I mean, there was a lot of it at that time. Um, Armand and Verbo, David Apatow, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I thought this stuff is really absolute rubbish. Um, I mean, these people haven't a clue what's going on. Uh, and they're not thinking about it in a way in which they're going to get any clues either. Um, this is um, completely hopeless. Um, and I thought, well, but, but the, it must be possible to do it so that it isn't completely hopeless. So I would try and sort of learn how to do that. And I thought, well, I, I just must um, get somewhere where I can actually look at one of these properly. Um, and I got a completely um, whimsical chance opportunity to do so because the um, vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, who'd been a classics um, a PhD at King's, um, came to um, uh, Cambridge, came to King's um, in his sort of grand African sort of chief's capacity uh, and said, uh, any fellow of the college can come and teach at my university for a year if they'd like to. Um, uh, you know, it's an open invitation. And of course, uh, hoping that sort of molecular biologists and um, cosmologists would flood out, but uh, none of them. Uh, whatever reason I mean wanted to go but I thought well that's exactly the opportunity I would like to have and uh, a further contingency but absolutely vital one um, and there was an anthropologist from Cambridge who was just about to go to Ghana at that point um, who um, was going to do a piece of research in the countryside about uh, 200 um, miles from the capital and um, we agreed that we would work together on the um, area that he was going to study and that I would do things for which my training had equipped me and um, and equipped me better and he would do those that which is equipped him better and um, what that meant was that when I got to the University of Ghana and taught, I mean, the terms went very long um, and I didn't have to be there except during the terms. Um, I thought that I would um, do the archival research um, that, that was needed there. And I did some obviously in Britain before I went to Ghana. Um, and that um, I would go and um, stay with him in his um, uh, habitat in, in the, in the forest, little, tiny forest town that he lived in um, and to get to know the area and I um, took over that, uh, that habitat when he went back to Britain and I was there um, in, in Ghana for the first post Nkrumah um, election um, and I knew enough about the place by then to be able to sort of follow the election from um, uh, you know, as it were, the top of Ghanaian politics in the capital because you, you, you were I suppose a white teaching at the university and you had your front room you could uh, go and talk to the people, I mean, not everyone, but I mean to people high up in, in um, politics and some of my colleagues in the university were very involved in, in, in the campaign on behalf of one of the parties. Um, so I, uh, and, but also I could really watch it um, uh, in, in, the, in the forest area um, and see what was going on. In it. And, um, I mean, that, that experience was very exciting. Ghana is a very, very engaging country. Um, 
and it's rather challenging from a health point of view and from some other points of view too, but um, it was very, very exciting, and very, very interesting. Um, and when I came back again, I mean, he and I um, wrote a book together about uh, research, a large book. Um, and um, at the end of that, I mean, I hadn't, I, 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 I got enough, as it were, a sense of what it was that um, one post-colonial state that actually consisted in. Um, to think that I could uh, start trying to see, to sort of compare and contrast with others. So, and I, so I did a bit of sort of comparative politics, I suppose, for, I don't know, um, five years or so, seven or eight years. Um, and um, the key thing, um, and I might just have gone on doing that, I might easily have gone on doing that. And the reason I didn't go on doing that was um, because of what I really learned about politics in Ghana, which I hadn't really previously taken in, um, which is really just how overwhelmingly destructive it can be. And that was a deep existential shock. I was very, very involved in Ghana. And I knew people in Ghana right well, really well right across the class structure in ways I've never done anywhere else. Um, and um, it, uh, about, um, about uh, three years after I um, came back from uh, my first period in Ghana, which was about a year and a bit, um, I went back once before then for a month or two months, I don't remember quite how long. Um, while the um, elected government was still in situ. But um, uh, then I went back um, after we, our book was published, because I thought I should go back and, um, in a sense, sort of um, uh, stand up for it or, or apologize for it. It just turned out to be appropriate. I mean, in the face of the people that it was partly about. Um, but. Um, between the, the um, second and third visit, I mean, there had been uh, another military coup and uh, the new military government was very, very um, ruthless and uh, completely um, disgraceful. I mean, absolutely um, uh, unashamedly um, appropriative and uh, violent and very just ruined everyday life for um, a very large proportion of the population of Ghana and so people I'd known really well again right across the class structure had their lives completely taken to pieces and one of my closest friends who had uh, become uh, very much against my advice had become head of the special branch of the police because the the incoming prime minister asked him to do so because he was someone he could trust, as someone who'd been in the United Nations before. He was a lawyer, um, quite high up in the United Nations. Um, uh, he was um, in a maximum security prison under a death sentence at the time that I went back, and I just thought, I cannot take this. This is just completely beyond me. I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about it, and it's absolutely appalling. And I can't bear to spend my time sort of um, steer, staring at it at close range. It's just um, beyond me to do that. Um, so I went on doing some comparative politics, but I did it in a, a very different way. I mean, I thought I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to go on relating to Ghana because it's just too rendingly upsetting. Um, so I will just have to do this kind of work in a much more abstracted and uh, sort of um, uh, processing of other people's work way. And I, 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 it was interesting doing that. I got some interest out of it and I learned a certain amount about it. But what I, what I crucially learned from the experience um, was um, very much at the existential level. I, re I, I recognized, I think, for the first time, 
quite what a serious subject I had set myself to try to understand. And I thought, um, uh, I've thought about politics from then on uh, uh, as a space of very, very extreme danger. And of course, it just simply isn't true that most political theorists think about it that way at all. And I think that's why their political thinking is um, so crummy, I suppose. I mean, I think you, you can't think seriously about politics without realising what the stakes in it are and how very easy it is for it to come out badly wrong. You just simply can't think about it unless you recognise that. Um, and so I, that is what, um, I mean, the one book I've written, which is a sort of relatively systematic attempt to uh, show people what I think politics is, the, the cunning of unreason. Um, I mean, that, the, um, the sensibility in that book, I mean, is the sensibility that, um, uh, as it were, overcame me as a result of my experiences in Ghana. I think. Um, so it's had a very big effect in that respect. Yeah, so when I read that book, um, The Cunning of Own Reason, um, it's a very sobering book. Um, I also got the impression that the author might have been a bit depressed writing it. Um, it was, you felt, you'd, you'd obviously seen, when politics, as you say, the stakes in politics couldn't be higher. If, if it goes wrong, people get killed and horrible things happen. And, uh, you know, the important thing, therefore, is to try and avoid that happening, which is, is not easy, um, especially uh, if certain countries have certain histories or things are just inherently unstable. Um, is that, it was, was, was it towards that book then that you... Was was that the making of that book that uh, when you after the Ghanaian experience the because that came the the cunning of unreason came a bit a good bit later didn't it? Yes, I I mean that book also was an accident. I mean all, all my work is really accidents of different kinds, but um, I mean the accident in that case was that I was asked by Frank Pemerge, who was a fellow of King's and had um, had a big publishing success with a series of, uh, called Modern Masters. It was mostly about sort of exciting French or German persons, I mean, of whom the British had previously heard little, or the Anglophones had previously heard little, and for which there proved to be massive effective demand. So, I mean, that, he, that made a hell of a lot of money for um, Fontana. Um, and so they asked him to edit another series. And the other series was called Master Guides, and that was supposed to be someone who really could do a subject was going to tell people how to do it. Um, and the first, uh, it's a comic element of this, but I can think of three volumes in that series. The first of them was, um, was uh, Ronald, Ronald Dawkins book, Law's Empire. Hmm. Um, and the um, second was a book by my uh, very dear friend, uh, Wynne Godley, who was an economist. Um, economic forecasts of a very eccentric kind um, and um, he was trying to work out in a way uh, how to do economics so that it worked in relation to the real world at a time when that was um, comprehensively out of fashion um, and um, his eccentricity I mean <laughs> didn't, didn't help as it were to get it, uh, his venture taken seriously but anyway that book I think really did rather or still born from the press. I mean, I'm sure that Dawkins book sold acceptably, but it didn't sell on the scale of um, the, the book about Foucault or the book about Marcuse, if you see what I mean. So it didn't, mm. uh, didn't swell the Fontana profits in the right way. Um, and um, then there was a book by uh, Robert Hine, very distinguished ethologist about animal behavior. Um, I don't think that so very well either, but he was a very boring writer. Um, and then there was my book, and I, I thought, well, um, you know, this is a nice thing to try to do, and there was a substantial bribe attached to it, thanks, as it were, to uh, rendering Foucault or Habermas for anglophone consumption. Um, 
were Conte, it was Anglais, as it were. Um, the, Sartre, an, an Irishman wrote uh, the book on Sartre, Conor Cruz O'Brien. Yes, well, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I rest my case. I mean, <laughs> I, I, well, I, you know, I wasn't Gorky's and I wasn't so uh, Conor Cruz O'Brien. So, uh, but I, I didn't have fantasies about this it going to be a wonderful book. But actually, I thought, well, actually, I do sort of know how to think about politics. And so I'll just, um, uh, you know, take it slowly and um, steadily and see what I can show. So I took it certainly slowly, very steadily. And I found, well, really, I'm running into very, very bad weather. <laughs> and the weather got worse and worse and worse. Um, and, um, you know, at the end, I suppose I stopped at exhaustion. But I, I still think that actually that book is, um, I mean, the subtitle of that book, um, which is not really what the subtitle should have been for the series. Um, I mean, I mean, my, um, I mean, the subtitle of the book, Making Sense of Politics, um, was a sort of acknowledgement of what I'd been trying to do, mm. but it wasn't, as it were, an actual report, report of what I'd been, um, of the fantasy on the basis of which I'd been commissioned to do it. <laughs> cool. um, and um, yes, it's sort of, this is no um, subject um, for the, um, for the, uh, nervous and um, readily tired. I mean, that, that's, <laughs> that's what comes out of the book, really, uh, I think. I mean, I think, and I do think it actually shows that it really is very difficult to understand politics. Mm. And it would be ridiculous to exaggerate the degree of your success in understanding it at any point. I mean, all you can do is try. And I think it's quite a good, um, sort of abstention of how it's a good idea to try. Um, but I don't, I'm afraid, I don't think it had uh, any element at all of showing how you can confidently rely on succeeding. And I don't yes. think you can confidently rely on succeeding. I think that's just the bottom line. I think it, the, the idea that you might be able to is completely absurd if you understand what it is you're trying to understand. I mean, one of the things that that book probably, well, like, like all your books, really, there, there's a lot of, you're disabusing us of illusions, you know. Um, that's kind of a, a constant theme, you know. We getting Trying to demyth, um, demystify things and get rid of, there's so many myths about politics. Um, and I thought that book was particularly good in exposing them. And... Um, but I think the other thing was, as you say, it's not an easy read. It's, um, um, well, neither was Law's Empire by Ronald Dworkin. They, these were quite serious books. They may have been positioned, as you say, as introductions, but they didn't feel introductory. No, I, I don't think they really, um, I mean, what people would buy um, as introductions are... Um, books which show them how to do what they need to get done. And I don't think anybody could say that Dworkin's book does that, and I don't think anybody could say that my book does that. So in that sense, they were simply mislabeled as, as introductions. I mean, mine was, actually neither of them were labeled on the title page as introductions. I mean, uh, Dworkin is a you know, was when he was there as unabashed as people come, so he didn't uh, pretend to have done something he had no intention of trying to do. Um, but, um, and I didn't, uh, I, I didn't need to pretend either, really. Um, no. But I, what, I, what I tried to do, I, I, I did, I mean, is there on the title page, I was trying to show people how you can um, make sense out of what it is that politics ter turns out to be, um, and um, it doesn't. It doesn't say, you know, the sense you'll make out of it is um, uh, platonic in um, uh, clarity. Um, it says 
it's not going to be atonic in clarity. Yes, and I think that's... If you have, if you have platonic clarity, you've lost politics. Yes, the... exactly. Yeah, but you, you replace artificial neatness with um, authentic messiness, really. Um, and I think that's, that's what... You kind of know you're kind of reading real political theory or real moral theory when, it's, when it does feel a bit chaotic and that you can't take away Ten Commandments. And superficial books, they kind of massage the illusion that you can. You know what I mean? Like people that don't know anything about politics and they read an introduction to politics and that gives them those 10 insights, the chances are they're probably all false, but people at least walk away with the illusion that now they understand politics. Whereas if they pick up one of your books, they're probably going to be very quickly frustrated uh, because you're not going to give them that. Uh, yes, no, well, I can't give them that. I mean, uh, it's not that I would withhold it if I could give it. Yes, no, no, you're not holding it back. Um, but I think if we may move on now to, um, I suppose, after that, your work on democratic theory and, and, and practice is kind of something that's preoccupied you. I suppose really for the second half of your career. Um, and, you know, some of your major works in recent years, um, I'm thinking, obviously, of Setting the People Free, the Story of Democracy. You edited a book on democracy. Um, and then you had your lectures in Yale. So it's obviously been something um, that's been on your mind. Um, can you tell us a little bit about why, why democracy has become so important to you? Well, again, I mean... Um there's a very large proportion of accident in the way it happened. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have written about democracy if I hadn't already done so in Western political theory in the face of the future. And if that hadn't carried to people, I mean, some of the you know, flashier phrases in it hadn't stuck around. But, um, and because uh, they had stuck around, I was asked um, by a Greek woman um, who was uh, very closely involved with um, the publisher um, Colin Haycraft, who was quite an influential publisher in some ways, um, Alistair McIntyre's publisher, amongst other things. Um, I was asked um, to... Um, to, to take part in a um, sort of, um, I suppose, celebratory intellectual response to um, 2,500 years of democracy starting from Athens. Um, so it was a Greek, as it were, um, cultural sort of boasting um, space. Um, and I thought, well, actually, it because um, I'd seen that as a result of, of the limited amount of work I did for the democracy chapter in Western political theory. I thought, well, actually, it is very, very interesting uh, that. And um, I, I was offered uh, quite a lot of money to uh, somehow Haycraft fell by the wayside. But um, I was offered quite a lot of money by um, uh, Oxford University Press to publish a, a book of that kind, um, a sort of historical conspectus of democracy and its vicissitudes. Um, and um, the, uh, the way the money was uh, made available, almost all of it, was uh, in, in sort of... Um, adequately sized bribes to individual scholars to do what they, in my judgment, were um, best equipped to do. And most of the people I asked um, did agree. Um, and um, yes, I think most all of them were quite good choices. Um, I won't go any further in that direction. Um, but um, the, the um, I, I Oxford published the book, and um, they um, 
and it so reasonably well. I mean, it was a sort of time in which it was natural for a book like that to get reviewed quite widely. Um, and the bits I wrote in it myself, um, which were, um, I mean, certainly on the flashy side, um, I mean, were bits of sort of serious further thinking on my part about the subject, with the to some degree the benefit of uh, the scholarship of others that I've accumulated for the volume, uh, but partly also I mean, lots of other thinking I've been doing about other things for other reasons in the interim. Um, so I think the um, conclusion I wrote for that, I mean, I thought that that actually traveled quite widely. Um, it got some serious intellectual attention from intellectually serious people in different places. So, um, and the book was fairly widely translated and so on. Um, so, I mean, that, um, I mean, I'm, um, quite a lot of my intellectual life is sort of, um, demand feeding response. I mean, because other people wanted to know what I kept on asking, what I thought, um, I kept on um, trying to uh, organize my mind to answer uh, about it. And so I kept on thinking about it. And then uh, as I kept on thinking about it, um, I, I thought, well, actually, I could write a proper book about this myself. I mean, that would be a sensible thing to do. Um, because I do understand quite a lot about it now, and I, I, it's, um, it is very, it's a very distinctive aspect of um, uh, human intellectual and practical history, and I, uh, I, to try and say something clear about that would be a, an educational um, value. Um, and I got an agent who got some money for doing it, and I settled down to try and do it, and. I learnt um, quite a lot more than I bargained for in, in trying to do it. And I, um, in particular, I learnt something uh, very clearly, which I haven't ever put to myself very clearly before, which is that the um, category of democracy comes back into serious political use at a point in time when it's already too late for it to be a, um, a, an accurate characterization of the political reality of any society. And I, uh, I mean, the way that book was written, I was, I followed the trail of the word, really. Um, and um, following that trail, that is the story that comes out. And it comes out, as it were, very fast, really. I mean, the clarification comes very fast in the last um, uh, quarter of the um, 18th century. So, and I thought, well, it's all there on the plate. If you, you know, if you blow the picture up and see carefully what's there, that's what's there. And I thought it's actually there in the, this, um, this uh, sort of um, brief formula in the thinking of um, writing, anyway, of this uh, rather ludicrous, in many ways, figure, um, Michele Buonarotti, describing the um, conspiracy of the equals in the aftermath of Thermidor. Um, and um, uh, that says, I mean, democracy, the idea of um, political equality um, is a, um, an integrated uh, political project and um, it's in um, profound and um, mortal combat with a way of organizing human life um, uh, which um, is uh, incompatible with it. So at the point in, in, um, in um, I would say, uh, modern history in which democracy becomes 
politically championed as a um, political goal by people who have um, disambiguated it from other things, um, it um, becomes clear that it's, it is um, at war um, and bound to remain at war with a world um, structured through um, a, a global market, um, the order of the economists. Um, and we live in the order of the economists um, and um, it wasn't so self-evident on the streets of Paris that people did live in the order of the economists at that point in time. So the fight was still on, but the fight's over now. I mean, that fight is over now. Um, I mean, we can't have political equality um, because uh, we have, uh, I mean, irredeemable economic and social inequality. Um, I mean, political equality crashes on, um, or crashed, I would say, on entering that world. And um, when it became clear as a political um, goal or project, um, that was the world it was trying to enter. Um, so the second coming was um, pre-fated to be destined to fail. It has failed, but of course we live in the ruins of its failure and um, it's very, very important for us how drastically it fails and every, um, every push back from that goal against the order of the economists is, uh, I mean, I'm not insulting members of the modern profession, although I can do that if I want to, but I, I, in saying that, I mean, I just mean the global capitalism um, and, you know, anything you can do to it through political restructuring. Um, when you look at that then, I mean, that you had this kind of fatal, um, conspiring of two in incompatible forces, the entrenchment of commercial society, which was already pretty entrenched by then. And then you have this emergence of a political ideal that is peculiarly inappropriate for that particular type of social organization and economic organization. Um, Is it, it, are we to derive from that that there's something almost inescapable now about the, about commercial society, that, that we can't really get rid of it, and because we can't get rid of it, its tentacles are everywhere. Um, the more we try and strive for democracy, the more hopeless it is. Well, it depends exactly what we're hoping for. Um, I think the, um, first of all, I think it is everywhere. And I think that it's, um, you know, it's fatuous to suppose that we might um, prevail against it because it's, um, it's our habitat. We haven't got anywhere else to be. Um, and uh, the challenge of being in it is to try and uh, limit its damage. And the, um, the political project that failed, you know, on the launch pad, um, blew up on the launch pad. Um, I think that is the, the, the point of that is to um, try to limit the damage um, and to try to limit the damage um, what I think is the, you know, I'm a moral realist at some level, not technically, but I mean, you know, sort of existentially. Um, I, I think um, to limit the damage on behalf of um, our, as it were, all our fellow animals. I mean, obviously some considerably less damaged by it than others. I mean, Bill Gates, not that noticeably. Um, if, I mean, if we take your perspective and we adopt it, that to me seems to change the sort of questions you ask about democracy. 
what what you can expect from it and what you certainly can't expect from it. Yes, well, I think it does. I mean, it certainly has changed the questions I've asked about it quite a lot. I mean, I've, I've gone on asking why is it that this word has become as highly um, positively connected as it has politically, um, and what uh, features of the political institutions that have uh, claimed to be um, um, blessed by consecrated through it um, are actually um, in any sense at all connectable with the idea and um, what's the connection where there is any connection and which aspects of them are salutary and which aspects of them are not and um, I mean I, I always think about politics through the question of what is to be done and I always think you know, when, the idea that the, the world we live in could be um, in um, real time from our own point of view vastly different for the better as a result of our efforts I mean is is ridiculous but the idea that it doesn't need to be quite as bad as it is um, is just overwhelmingly convincing and actually I don't think um, there's a wonderful um, lecture of Strawson's um, called Freedom and Resentment, which I still think is one of the best expressions at this point. I mean, we can't actually live as the sorts of animals we are without at least believing that we can make things less bad in our immediate vicinity by things we do. I mean, it's not actually, um, it's not an imaginatively sustainable posture unless you simply feel you have no residual agency at all. It's not a discretionary perspective from an agent's point of view. And I, you know, because I mind about how bad things are for how many people, I um, think about um, what can be done about what I mind about. Um, because I'm interested in a lot of the world. I mean, I think about it in different settings, as it were. And, um, in um, addressing different audiences too. Um, it, it, one of the things that kind of, you know, you hear people thinking about, you know, when you look at how bad certain democracies have become, I mean, you know, you don't look, have to look very far if you're in, if you're in Great Britain at the moment um, to see, you know, how they've been abused. Um, and then uh, you look at America. So what we what what we're naively taught is the two kind of homes of Western democracy, um, Britain and, and America now look like the two deformations of democracy. Um, and you you know you're hearing people now kind of trying to reassert some sort of form of Platonism. You know why just we don't why don't we just have enlightened bureaucrats running the show? Uh, that won't impose this madness on us. We don't have people that are sufficiently politically engaged or informed to be making the right decisions about who to vote for because we don't have a proper functioning democracy. Why don't we just get rid of this model and revert to, well, an enlightened despot or an enlightened bureaucracy? I mean, well, what would you say to that? Well, that is, I suppose, a platonic train of thought. And... and um I mean, I, all I would say is it's just politically impracticable. Um, we, we, um, first of all, you have to, as it were, um, enlighten the enlightened bureaucrats. Um, and then you have to, well, I suppose so, you have to pick bureaucrats who are susceptible of enlightenment and then you have to enlighten them and then you have to um, induce the um, your fellow citizens to comply with what they um, propose. Um, I mean I don't think it's just completely misconceived that way of seeing political problems. I mean the United Kingdom would be in much less of a mess if in fact it hadn't um, impaired the quality of its civil service to quite 
so she high degree and acquired such a lamentable collection of um, politicians in office. Um, so we don't, we don't, there's nothing structural which ensures that we must be in as much of a mess as we are at the moment. Um, but um, the, I don't think there is any um, uh, human propensity to accept uh, bureaucracy because it's enlightened and the, the sort of residual political force of democracy as a category is very much as a way of interpreting how it's possible to authorize political power uh, practically as opposed to sort of purely fancifully and of course there's a large element of the fanciful in the authorization but but it isn't all fancy um, and um, it is true that people are more prepared to obey governments which they have some reason for supposing they've personally chosen than they do for governments that they've had no causal connection with at all. If they are under a government of that kind and it's uh, and things are going swimmingly from their point of view, they may be um, uh, quite uh, happy to be under it. But um, um, things don't go swimmingly from everyone's point of view ever. So, um, I mean, uh, the question of how you can reconcile yourself to be governed, um, what, on what sort of imaginative basis you can reconcile yourself to be governed, is a, 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 a quite a harsh question. And actually, democracy is the, um, I mean, sort of conceptual survivor. Uh, in a democracy in our present sort of um, etiolated sense is the conceptual survivor uh, of the answer to that question. The, the, the answer is, well, you know, the best prospect for doing so is you um, play a sort of uh, identifiable part in the um, causality of who it is. Well, well, yes, and if you look at it that way, I mean, that seems to me to go beyond a instrumental justification for democracy, you know, like something along the lines of, you know, it's, it's the worst form of government apart from all the others, and the only reason we really want democracy is that we can kick out the, the rulers if they get bad, and that's, that's a good enough justification for democracy. But you're suggesting there that it could, be, it could and should be something more even even in the context of a global capitalism? I'm definitely suggesting it is something more. Um, and the more is, it's, um, it, it's uh, an imaginative basis which renders being governed caterings paribus. Very important clause. Um, uh, more endurable than any alternatives that have so far been imagined. I mean, if you thought you were being governed by the form of the good, um, even if you, you know, had a bit of difficulty in picking it up yourself visually, um, but if you were absolutely confident that that's what was governing you, that would be very reconciliatory too. But I don't see how you could be absolutely confident and I don't think actually, um, you know, even Plato said you could be absolutely confident. In fact, he says, you know, most people couldn't be confident on that basis. They have to be told a sort of fairy story um, in order to reconcile them. But the question of how being governed can be endurable, we certainly do need to be governed. Um, and uh, the large chunk of modern political philosophy, which sort of um, that is with the thought that maybe we don't really, or maybe it's just important that we need to be governed. I mean, that just eliminates itself from political seriousness by, by that. But we do need to be governed, and actually we need more and more and more to be governed. I mean, this is not a, it's not a, there isn't any retreat from this requirement. Um, yeah. And actually, it, it's, it's both dangerous and um, at some level sort of, um, Sort of biologically um, uncomfortable to be governed. And I think that a basis for um, reconciliation with the need in practice is very, very practically required. And that's why democracy has, you know, has pulled ahead 
of uh, monarchy and aristocracy. And monarchy is a very good idea in many ways because it's just the idea that there is a um, last instance decision procedure which um, works. Um, but um, of course, it's um, extremely vulnerable to monarchs. Um, and um, the uh, point of democracy, uh, which is one of the re another reason why so much of modern democratic theory is absolute rubbish. Um, the, the point about uh, democracy isn't that if you get everyone's opinions and you sort of put them in the blender, what comes out is um, steady good sense. I mean, if you put everyone's opinions into the blender, what comes out is gibberish, mm. you know, sludge. Um, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, a completely, practically absurd view. Um, I mean, that's, that's what's striking me about what's happening now. I mean, I think those sort of fundamental questions about, you know, because democracy is under such pressure at the moment and we're seeing how abusable it is and, you know, the sort of trash you get running countries, it's, it's just shown how... Um, how open to abuse it is. People are now, I think, legitimately asking, you know, the platonic question. And, you know, the, the, the natural rebuttals to that, that are, you know, who guards the guardians and how, do you, how can you trust the enlightened? How do you know they're enlightened? I don't think those rebuttals are quite as decisive as they might have been in the past. And I, feel, I, I also feel that those conversations should be a legitimate conversation to have. Uh, and I'd like to think that they will re-emerge. I mean, a Democrat should be able to give a good justification for democracy that uh, can be robust enough to deal with the, you know, the classic platonic objection. Why would you entrust politics to amateurs? Um, and that's, for me, a still a very fundamental question. Well, my answer to that is very simple-minded, and, uh, and it's... Um obviously not an answer which delivers a um, working model of how to um, ensure that you're governed to the better. But my answer is that um, it, it, it is uh, increasingly important for um, the way in which government is exercised to be um, accepted and there's no chance of it being accepted except by um, a particular, admittedly fairly minimal form of consent. I just think it's right that, politically right. Um, and, and if you uh, take the platonic uh, question seriously, you have to take the platonic answer seriously yes. too. And Plato didn't say, um, this, is a, you know, this is a vehicle, um, you uh, can readily uh, board and be confident will um, work indefinitely. Um, I mean, he explained why. Um, it's an extreme um, idea and it has um, a very, very strong um, propensity to deteriorate. He, tried, he showed, I mean, why it's such a very drastic um, idea. Um, and I think the drastic idea has extraordinary critical power and it's absolutely appropriate to um, you know, let it rip on democracy as it's currently sort of blousily um, entertained as a sort of um, you know, received political result. Um, but I don't think it, um, provides a, uh, another uh, result for us to um, you know, accept instead. I just don't think it does. I mean, it's absolutely obvious, it's self-evidently right that actually if you are going to be governed and you need to be governed, you need a competent government. And of course you don't get a competent government through election to the Houses of Parliament or the um, Senate of the United States. You don't get a competent judge really out of um, uh, nomination to the Supreme Court. I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of um, purposefully intruded incompetence in our structures. Um, 
but um, insofar as those structures have any sort of prudential robustness in place of what's introduced to them, that uh, prudential robustness comes from the residual bureaucratic competence. It doesn't come from somewhere else. No. One of the things that when you say there that's, that strikes me as well is that even if you had a cast iron guarantee that the philosopher kings and queens were, were virtuous and all knowing, so let's imagine that you, per impossibile, you get that guarantee and everyone is convinced in the, in the world or in the nation that you, you know, these people are the right people. You could argue at this moment in our time, because we're not living in ancient Athens, that we would find it an insult or degrading in some way to be, find ourselves in that position. So it wouldn't be a good model for how to be a human being to find yourself trusting these so-called good and great to make our decisions. We've, we've kind of gone past that. We all believe that we're owed a level of political equality and dignity and that if we allowed a huge part of our lives to be determined by the, this virtuous minority, that itself even wouldn't be enough to convince us that we should go there. Yes, it's a very deep area that, and I haven't really thought my way through it very clearly, but I mean, you, there are a number of different things you can say about it. I mean, of course, it's definitely right politically, and that's sort of part of where, where I was coming from, and when I said it's just politically impracticable um, to have something other than a, um, a citizen equality um, uh, accountable structure. Mm. sporadically and feebly but still that's the conceptual character of the structure i mean that is the authorization principle we um require now uh, i mean it's not the authorization principle they require in china because they're not in a position to uh, require it i mean this is a contingent historical matter i mean mm. i think like i've already said i mean china is um in some ways, very much better government than um, the United Kingdom. Uh, you know, as we get on to the United States, um, but it's governed on a basis which is very ugly, really. In the last instance, it's governed on the basis of an unaccountable um, uh, political elite um, with um, some very cruel habits. Um, so. I mean, the case in favour of it is its um, outcome for the majority. The case against it is um, the mode of its governing and the basis on which it does so. Um, so, I mean, I think we are lucky, as it were, in that respect, um, not to be citizens of China. Um, to be citizens of uh, the United Kingdom or Ireland or even the United States, well, I suppose faith required to say that at the moment. But um, I, I think I mean, another thing to say about it is that the um, the um, culture generated um, across the world by the operation of global capitalism over couple of centuries is a culture which has um, depleted the capacity for humility and increased the propensity to narcissism across human populations and that um, philosophers have not got on top of what that means. Um, I mean they haven't got as it were the evaluative significance of that at all. Um, and um, I think that the, the question of, of um, human equality is a very, very philosophically and practically complicated matter. And I think the sense in which it is um, appropriate to view humans as equal isn't one in which they come out as having equivalent value. Uh, 
because the value they have must be something which they are capable of realizing and performing. And experience of yourself and certainly experience of yourself in the company of other people suggests that humans vary very drastically in their capacity to perform valuably. So in that sense, you, it is wrong. It's simply false to say that humans are equal. Mm. The sense in which humans are equal is they all have imaginations, they all suffer. I mean, it depends on how sort of wrecked you are. I mean, if you're obviously just um, surviving in a vegetable state, those, these things don't apply. But actually, in the relevant um, uh, distribution of humans, which is the very great majority of humans, um, it's right to think of humans as all um, being animals uh, which are vulnerable in exactly the same way and uh, open to um, sort of joy and misery in the same sort of way. I mean, you can have your capacity for joy very seriously impaired by your experiences and presumably you can have it somewhat enhanced by your experiences too. Um, certainly the sense you get, as it were, of the sort of leaving mode of leaving Oxford undergraduate. Um, but um, the, the um, I think, I think we don't have a, a sort of surviving idiom of um, political um, perception and evaluation, which shows us how to relate those two pretty prominent characteristics of humans sort of um, severally on the hoof. Mm. Um, and actually to think politics in a way which has, as it were, a platonic degree of clarity and um, stability to it, you would require that. Yep. So I think the, um, I mean, a, a great deal of the, um, the sort of pious rubbish that is uh, spoken politically nowadays is spoken through a completely indefensible conception of human equality. Um, and um, I think that actually that it necessarily involves some degree of betrayal of the way, um, political betrayal of the way in which it um, makes very, very robust sense. And there is obviously enormous um, evaluative force in thinking of humans as equal in their vulnerability and uh, exposure to suffering, and rather more limited capacity for um, uh, sort of reliable exhilaration. A, a book that that you know, the way you're talking there, a book that struck me as quite impressive. That was, I I, I didn't obviously accept its, you know, it's got certain uh, views about religion that I don't. But Charles Taylor's book, The Ethics of Authenticity. That book seem to me to be definitely at least around the edges of where we need to go and to try and make sense of why people think that personal autonomy and then authenticity, what it is to be live an authentic individual life. That seems to me that might provide the bridge between democracy and living in a commercial world and why, why we think that, you know, um, democracy is the least worst form of government, and not just instrumentally. Yes, no, I think I agree with that. I mean, I, I think Charles Day is a very sympathetic figure in all sorts of ways. I mean, and of course it's true that his, um, what's enabled him to see things the way he does is, is um, as in the case of Ashton McIntyre, is, is uh, the sort of solidity of his um, uh, Catholic formation, I suppose. Um, the, I mean, not that you would say that Halster's Catholic formation was all that solid because he pinged around um, from the point of view of um, confessional allegiance. But um, he, uh, I mean, I think his, uh, I suppose, his mature work is very, very um, situated inside um, Catholicism. And uh, I, you know, that's not a situation I can. As a matter of myself, inside 
but I think it, it's given him a sort of a steadiness of exploration and a, a confidence in, of course, he is a very um, intellectually honest person compared with most, compared with almost anyone. Um, but um, I think it's given him the, the, the nerve to think deeply through a way of seeing the world and um, explain it to people. Um, mm. And I think it's, um, I mean, he, he, he and Taylor are a very, uh, there's potentially a very interesting dialogue between the two of them. I don't know it's ever been staged, but I mean, the roots between the two of them. I mean, they've got, both got quite a long way in seeing things which do actually matter a great deal for, um, uh, I would say, all of us. But, um, they, um, I mean, they they are both so deeply committed to um, a, a way of stabilizing um, vision and sentiment, which um, is just rather restrictedly available. I mean, it's available inside certain cultural niches, but it's not available generally. So the question of how sort of workable their results are is, is a really important one and I, you know, I thought about it quite a lot for a bit and um, much younger but I, I haven't really thought about it recently because I've been uh, chasing democracy uh, yes instead John we're coming to the end and I, maybe I, I, I thought it would be before we do finish maybe if you know you, you, you spent your most of your intellectual life at King's College, which has obviously been your intellectual home. And uh, when you look back, uh, uh, can you say some of the highlights that, that of, of your time there in terms of either people or events or experiences? Well, the college has changed a great deal over time. And um, when I was, um, when I arrived, Noel Allen was provost and he was a very young provost, he was a very ambitious provost, he was an exceedingly self-gratified provost um, and he had a real flair for um, accumulating intellectual talent. I mean he was like a sort of football um, manager. Um, I mean he knew who to, who to hire um, and um, the college was very, very exciting in his day, and the excitement um, uh, persisted really for quite a long time. But I think it was made very exciting by him. There had been a lot of impressive people there beforehand, and one of the people, obviously, a very impressive person who'd been there a long time beforehand but was still there when I came off as an undergraduate was. Um, Ian Forster, who was an oh, yeah. unusual thing to have around an academic establishment, really. Um, and um, there were uh, a number of very, very brilliant scientists who came to King's because of, um, of no, I mean, the most brilliant of them, I think, really was Sidney Brenner. Mm. Um, and um, there, I mean, it, it was because of, um, I don't remember exactly about the timing, but my, I mean, it was because of what Noel had made of the college that uh, in his provostship, which didn't last all that long, um, that um, uh, Bernard would definitely have chosen to come to King's. Um, I don't know if Noel was still provost when Bernard came. I think he was, um, but uh, I mean, it, his imprint was still very, very heavy on. Um, and um, I mean, Noel was, Noel taught in the English faculty actually. Um, and he, um, he was very excited by um, the English tripos and um, he was very keen on bringing sort of, um, sort of literary glitter to the college. Um, um, you know, not just sort of proud of the E.M. Foster as a sort of mascot um, and epitome of the sort of old uh, splendour of kings. Um, but um, I mean, they, they, I remember uh, 
a um, couple of people arrived as English dogs at the same time for a bit. Neither of them lasted there very long. Uh, one of them was Dennis Donahue, mm -hmm. and the other was John Gross. And they were both, um, you know, they, they, they lent a bit of glitter to the place in their very different styles. They were both, both something. Um, and of the people who were fellows um, uh, when I became a fellow in uh, 1966, um, and I worked with uh, pretty closely, I mean, um, uh, besides Bernard, there was uh, Geoffrey Lloyd, who was a wonderful ancient philosophy and, um, and uh, ancient Greece means ancient China figure and how you understand the history of um, science um, comparatively. Um, and there were um, a number of really wonderful scientists who were closer to me in age, um, Martin Rees, um, uh, Dan McKenzie, um, uh, George F. Stathew, um, and there were people who uh, were provost after Noel Allen was um, Edmund Leach, who was um, a, a very, very um, exciting figure. He was a absolutely lamentable part provost initially because he was so anxious and he was so intemperate and he was so large and so angry. He was completely out of control and he was also in a state of blind panic. So he was, it was very hard coping with him in sort of um, notionally democratic, I mean, deliberate, public deliberation. Um, it, require, it required some obduracy, good nerves. Um, but um, he uh, settled into the role quite fast, and he was a he was a tremendous um, enthusiast for a sort of high intellectual life. I mean, he was, um, and I would say sort of much more seriously so than Noel. I mean, Noel was a sort of rhetorical and, and pompous and. Um, Yes, I mean, rather too gentle on himself figure, but uh, Edmund was really intellectually passionate and he had a very wide range of interests and he, he was very excited by how, uh, what, how much exciting intellectual life there was in the college and um, he called other people in um, and I think Frank Vermode must have come to King's while Edmund was provost and so and Frank was obviously a wonderful person to have uh, on sort of regular um, on tap, really, in the SCR, whenever you felt like talking to him. Um, and um, uh, yes, um, uh, what else would I think of particularly? Um, Alan McFarlane uh, was someone who came to um, King's as a, I mean, I, when I was director of studies in history, I, mean, I was one of the electors, I mean, we had a competition to get some historians and uh, at that point I thought the most exciting British historians were mostly pupils of Keith Thomas so we got a couple of pupils of Keith Thomas and one of them was Alan and he stuck around. Um, I mean Kings and you know there have been and I, I don't know I know there was, there's a very very um, attractive um, and clever and imaginative mathematician, Martin Highland, who I've known for sort of 35 years or something like that. You make close intellectual friendships with people across a very, very wide um, intellectual space in a setting like that. And all of those things were important for me. Um, and, you know, led me out in different directions to different places, I suppose. It sounds to me you're, you're more of a college man than a university man. Yes, well, the university was not, um, it certainly wasn't ever at any point generous to my subject, but it was actually completely oblivious to my subject until I'd uh, been in, in, in uh, it spatially for um, uh, over 10 years. So, and um, the point at which it decided it actually perhaps was worth uh, offering university teaching in was the point at which it essentially went into a sort of fiscal deep freeze 
for the um, rest of my um, lifetime. So, uh, I, I mean, it didn't, um, I mean, there are more people teaching politics in Cambridge now than there were in my day, but um, there aren't anything like enough, given the, uh, the scope of what there is to teach about and the importance of actually having some awareness of rather a lot of it. Um, I mean, actually, an undergraduate politics degree in Cambridge is a very good degree. And I think definitely better than a politics degree anywhere else in Britain, but um, possibly anywhere else I know of. But but it's um, so, you know, by accident, um, not, not because of the university's um, unerring educational design. Um, do you think that um, when you look at, King, at King's College today, um, do you think it's as intellectually rich as it was, you know, in the 60s and 70s? or? Or, 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 or can you even possibly comment on that? Well, I obviously should be a little bit more careful about in what I say about that and about some of the other things we've ta talked about, because it's more personal and it's more uh, immediate. And the, um, you know, loosely speaking, most of the people in question are now living. Mm. But um, I would say um, that the rewards of being in the college haven't diminished over time but the intellectual excitement of being in the college has subsided very considerably. And I wouldn't think that was because of um, something which has uh, happened essentially inside the college. I wouldn't think it was being caused from inside the college. I think it's an ecological matter. It's because of what's happened to universities uh, over time. And uh, it's partly the, um, the very different, um, this is an old Marxist point really, it's the very different amount of free time people in the universities have now as opposed to they had then. Uh, it's the relentlessness and the um, uh, punishment and reward system with the punishment leading as it were the rewards um, now and um, the degree of sort of um, often ludicrous degree of uh, in the humanities and social sciences of scholasticization which has occurred um, uh, through this process it's all connected up it's all connected up with um, the um, the changed relation of the state to um, the funding of higher education um, and um, the, um, yes, the incompetent, uh, intellectually incompetent intrusiveness of the state into the actual content of higher education as a sort of human community. Um, so I mean, there is a lot of depletion. People have, people have, uh, people are much less free, and they're much, uh, they're much, they're much more harassed. Um, but um, if I think of kings now, and as I think of the people I know and um, very fond of, and um, um, always. Um, rejoice to see. I mean, they're still dispersed across the disciplines and some of them come in disciplines where, you know, I have the foggiest comprehension of and never could have. But um, the way they are in the world and what the way they talk about things that both of us uh, affect both of us and uh, are both interested in um, is, uh, is very, very strongly additive. And I think of a set of engineers who I, a couple in particular I've known for a long time and then others as well around them. Um, and I think of um, this particular mathematician and I think of um, historians that, are in, that work in my um, bit of, the, of history in the days when I was mostly doing history. Um, and I think of um, the research fellows that come and go. I mean, there have been research fellows in the relatively past that I found uh, wonderful company. And actually, have a new research fellow in the 
history of political ideas in India, who's uh, very interesting indeed for me to talk and think with about what he does. I mean, it's very interesting indeed for me that. Um, and I, I mean, my closest friends, I suppose, there are you know, they range across sort of anthropologists and mathematicians and um, uh, English literature scholars and uh, historians of ideas. And, um, so the, the eclectic spirit lives on, which is which is nice to hear. Um, John, if, if I, I'd like to end this. Uh, interview and uh, well first of all by thanking you for giving you me your time to talk which i found fascinating um but i thought it might be nice if we end on a on a desert island discs note um it's one of my favorite bbc programs and one of the things i like and we're going to have to give you the abbreviated version i'm afraid which um but if if, if you did find yourself in a desert island and uh, you could only pick one one disc or one one record and one book and one luxury, what, what would they be? Um, uh, the record, I think, would probably have to be um, Casals playing the Bach cello suite. Um, I haven't really um, sort of pulled through with the book. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid I would probably have to um, eliminate by um, by length in the case of the book. I mean, I take it that one book uh, can be a very, very long book. And if I'm on a desert island with one book, it would need to be a very, very long book. And I, you know, of the very, very long books that have meant a lot to me over time, I probably, I would take um, A La Recherche du Temps Perdu in, um, one of its English translations. I, I like the um, Kill Martin one a lot, actually. But um, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy with any. I mean, I wouldn't be fastidious about that. Um, and I couldn't really, I suppose if, I, if that was a, it's one book when I was on the desert island, maybe it would be all right to have it in French, but I would need some sort of dictionary within reach. Because the vocabulary is a lot wider than mine. Um, yes. So what was the third thing? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. luxury. luxury, yes. Yes, no, that's absolutely impossible. I can't sort of begin to discipline myself in the face of that. I mean, I, if it's a single, see, it's very different, I mean, how you think of the uh, category. I mean, if it's a, a, a supply of X, which runs on, that's one thing. Uh, if it's a single item, um, you know, and I might, you know, for lots of items, I need cooking facilities. And I wouldn't be confident in my man Friday capabilities on the cooking, or Robinson Crusoe, I suppose it was, but capabilities on the cooking construction side. So um, I don't know. I think I would take, um, am I allowed a corkscrew as well? <laughs> <laughs> I would take a wonderful bottle of wine. <laughs> endlessly supplied looking at it like, yes well of course if it was replenished yeah <laughs> that would be best okay thank you very much john and um it's as i said it's been a real pleasure talking to you and uh i, I wish you all the best thank you well it's been very interesting for me and it made me think right. <laughs> this point's quite hard um thank you very much for having asked